And a good Monday, uh, Monday morning to you uh, at 8.30 Mountain Time, 10.30 Eastern. Welcome to Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you. And uh, we've got a great show in store. In just a second, we're going to get to uh, lawyer and journalist Sandy Garasino. She's done uh, ongoing reporting uh, for the National Observer. You can read it at nationalobserver.com around the the, the alleged uh, foreign funding theory, the conspiracy theory, some might call it, uh, of organized efforts against Alberta Energy. That's coming up today on the show. Also looking forward to Meet in the Middle Mondays. We're going to have, uh, well, it, it reminds me of that song, of course, uh, you know, where we, here I am stuck in the middle with you, although I suppose I'm calling our guests clowns and jokers, which I don't think they'd appreciate, would they? Uh, very much looking forward to Janice Irwin and Vitor Marciano joining us. I'm going to ask them right out of the gates, do they take issue with being characterized as the left and the right? We're we're so inclined to label people these days, it seems. Uh, maybe if we were less eager to label people and more eager to pick their brains on subjects that they care about or opinions that they might have, maybe we'd be a little better off. So, so why Janice and why Vitor? Well, the two of them, they ganged up on me uh, in a fun way on Twitter. But they actually, turns out they feel the same way, which is the opposite of the way that I was thinking maybe I might kind of sort of feel about something when it comes to funding health care. And it wasn't necessarily their perspectives that jumped out at me, but it was the fact that they both agreed. And the political parties that they've been inclined to support, at least in past with Vitor, we'll find out where he's at. I know he described himself as a small C conservative, but their political perspective is very different but their perspective on an issue, the same. And I found that to be quite encouraging. I thought, well, in this day and age, the more cooperation, uh, the, the more, uh, you know, as they might say, across the aisle or bipartisan efforts to solve issues, the better, right? So we're going to get into it with them. Uh, we're not going to spend, when they join us in about a half hour's time, we're not going to spend an hour talking about health care funding or health care premiums. Your eyes would, would slowly glaze over on this Monday, I know, and you'd say, I'm, I'm good on this for like two minutes, but but 40? So we're going to we're gonna see where that conversation goes as, as it ebbs and it flows, so to speak. And, of course, we'll be keeping an eye on our live chat. We'll be keeping an eye on our Real Talk RJ hashtag on Twitter. That's a great way to stay in touch with us, not just during the show while we bring you this live every weekday morning, but even later in the day, as you're listening to the podcast or catching up on what you may have missed, you can always hit us up using that hashtag. Carrie Tate joins us to talk about vaccines today. And then uh, Andre Domis will join us. Uh, had to reschedule our Friday conversation. He's been keeping an eye on the whole Wall Street thing, GameStop, trying to make sense of it. So, so I'm looking forward to that conversation. Of course, you know by now that Bitcoin Well is the presenting sponsor of Real Talk. And, and each and every morning, we mention them right out of the gates 2021 is a big year for crypto it's it's easy i think to find storylines here mentioning gamestop people are questioning financial institutions there's a lot of bitcoin elements here at play if you're trying to make sense of it all you want to figure out if bitcoins for you or not or just just try to understand what it all means there's no better source no better starting point than bitcoin well they're based out of edmonton they've got these bitcoin atms across canada and by far they're the easiest way to get information from a trusted source on crypto check out bitcoin well under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com real talk starts right now here's ryan jesperson We're also, of course, going to be getting into our Y Station question of the week. We're going to bring you some results on what you had to say about Keystone XL, what you had to say about coal mining, open pit coal mining in the Rocky Mountains. And then we're going to tee up. Uh, I'm actually going to go through and answer our question of the week. We're going to do it on camera. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see why we're excited about this. The team at Y Station has been burning the midnight oil, coming up with a different format this week. It's a bracket format. Like if you if if you're involved at all in sports, if you ever you know take part in a March Madness pool, for example, we're going to narrow down who real talkers think should be named Canada's next Governor General. And this exercise is I'm so excited about this. The exercise will carry on through the week. It's going to require a couple of different visits from you. In other words, we're going to need you out of the gates on this Monday or Tuesday 
to do your first version of the bracket. And then as we get results on that, it'll narrow itself down and ultimately we'll get down to a showdown. So that's one that's going to be coming up at ryanjesperson.com. If you want to answer the question right now, you just go to our website and across the top bar, you'll see it there, question of the week. I'm going to get into that a little later on in the show today. But let's get to our leadoff guest this morning. News broke late Friday, as it often does when... When any government at any level wants the wants the electorate to miss the story, they want it to fly under the radar, they bury it on a Friday. That's what the Alberta government did, uh, letting Albertans know that the deadline for this inquiry report into anti-Alberta oil campaigns, it's called the Allen Inquiry, was delayed. It was given another extension. That's the third extension now. Uh, Sandy Garasino has been covering this story uh, for a long time, as a matter of fact, for for the National Observer. She's a lawyer. She's a journalist. And 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 well, she's a former crown prosecutor now writing a national affairs column. Her 2019 analysis of that foreign funding controversy has emerged as a key reference for critics of the Allen Commission. Sandy, welcome to Real Talk and good morning to you. Thanks for having me on. We always want to recognize as well when a guest is joining us from the Pacific time zone, they've woken up even earlier than the rest of us. Uh, Sandy, this this extension, uh, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'll say, uh, you know, f- from my perspective, uh, this this inquiry was perceived by many people as a bit of a joke out of the gates uh, with budget extensions, time extensions, multiple ones. Now, I had nothing's happened to change my mind. Where do you stand on it? Well, it- I, it would be it would be charitable to call it a joke in the sense that um, you know we have a government funded inquiry into basically the associations um, and financial dealings of Canadians. You know, we're not looking at uh, corporations. We're not looking at um, anybody else. We are looking at Canadians who are active in the climate field, and it's actually quite concerning to have governments. Um, uh, scrutinizing and looking at Canadians as if there is something illegitimate um, uh, about uh, about advocating for climate action. Um, but having said that, uh, it, it's really hard to imagine that this could have gone worse for the inquiry and for Steve Allen, who I've had some dealings with. Okay, well, I want to get to those in just a second. But but is the big inflammatory part of this? <clears throat> politicians know what they're doing. Is it the use of the word foreign? Is it foreign funded campaigns against Alberta oil? Is this what's what's being utilized or at least intended to utilize to to whip people into a frenzy? Well, that's 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 actually part of that's that's the strange part of this. You know, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with foreign money if we're looking for investors, anything wrong with foreign money if you're looking for partners for international partnerships, relationships. But if you want to be a human rights activist anywhere in the world, and by the way, this is something that um, uh, conservative and authoritarian governments are cracking down on worldwide, and they are using the foreign tag uh, as a smear against um, uh, human rights activists and climate uh, and climate activists worldwide. This is not uh, specific to Alberta. This is a, a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to find the difference aside from maybe motivation, but the difference between a foreign investment or a foreign donation to, to Greenpeace or the Tides Foundation or a foreign investment or a foreign donation to the Fraser Institute or the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. I guess if you're cracking down on one, you better crack down on all, right? Well, uh, just take uh, universities in Alberta. Universities in Alberta have received uh, more in foreign grants, including from the U.S. government, um, than than climate activists. I mean, this is a massive uh, injection of capital that comes in uh, from um, uh, largely the United States. But the but the biggest foreign donor to Canadian nonprofits and educational institutes and uh, scientific institutes is the U.S. government, which over the um, uh, over the last decade has funneled hundreds of millions of dollars into Canadian uh, nonprofits. Sandy, let's let's get into sort of who we're dealing with. You, you mentioned that you have personal dealings uh, with uh, Steve Allen. Will you take us into the story? 
Well, I'm, I'm writing something, so it's going to be up on the National Observer later today, I expect, so I'll go into more detail. But I was contacted, I was texted uh, in the evening in November of 2019 by uh, Commissioner Allen, and we did engage and we, we had uh, significant communication. Uh, I'm very surprised to hear that he has, I know that he has reached out to uh, at least one other person that I'm aware of um, that I think would be associated with the skeptic side on the on the um, inquiry, uh, and I'm I'm really astonished that it's been over a year. It's been almost 15 months now, and and as far as we know, he has not reached out to the real principals involved in this. Who would be? I mean, if if you were tapped on the shoulder, Sandy, to to put together a report and the, the Alberta government freed up three and a half million dollars for you to do it. Where would you start your investigation? Who would you who would you talk to? I mean, who would be on your short list? Well, the first uh, so the first thing that I would do is I would go to some of the databases that track all all of the foundation uh, spending worldwide there there there's a phenomenal resource that is available and very inexpensive for a for a commission to access that that lays all of this open it, it, it kind of astonishes me that that this is thought to be like all this painstaking research that's gone into this all of this is in is easily searchable in a database it's it's you can easily access it so I would start there and I would start to compile I would then look at the broader context the wider context how anomalous are any of the donations that we're talking about? Or are they very characteristic in the nonprofit and charitable field? And then I would talk to, uh, I would start with Sephora Berman, who has, is the uh, main coordinator of all funding for the Tar Sands campaign uh, since 2011. Uh, it, it, it beggars the imagination that Sephora Berman, who knows where every dollar comes from and where every dollar has gone, and where has been, why hasn't anybody but he'd been talking to her. She knows all of this, and she can. And if she were to be persuaded to uh, engage with the commission, which I'm not sure that she would, just because of how uh, ineptly this whole thing and 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 in such a draconian way that this whole thing has been handled. But all of this could have been cleared up years ago. You you wonder ultimately what the goal is here. Like, let's like, let's say that that, you know, Mr. Allen, Commissioner Allen, like blows the doors off some massive conspiracy theory um, and, and, and comes up with with devastating evidence that's been flying under everybody else's radar. But he's able to dig it up. Then what? But evidence of what exactly? I mean, those of us who have um, who know this field well know that the CRA has been uh, conducting audits, was conducting audits for years from 2012 to I believe it was almost 2017 by the time the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, canceled those audits. Those, these things went on for years and years. I mean, all of this is really about uh, inflaming political rhetoric and, and uh, you know, at attacking people who have a different point of view than, than the prevailing view of the Alberta government. Um, but I, I can't imagine that at this point, after years of uh, federal audits, uh, with all of this material in, in absolutely open and in plain view and easy to access what the revelation would be. The, the value to Jason Kenney, the value to the Alberta government actually is for um, um, uh, Commissioner Allen not to report because he's undoubtedly going to come, come either come out with there's nothing here or perhaps uh, amplify the message of the, these reports that he has commissioned and paid for um, from people like this homeschooling professor uh, in, in the UK, that, that there's some grand conspiracy to fight climate change, which there is a global international organization of people and organizations trying to stop climate change and save the planet. Yeah. So th and that's the point, right, is is you, you can identify, you know, there are there are big groups that that operate with big budgets whose mandate is to 
get the world off fossil fuels, transition to sustainable energy. But the fact of the matter is they're not specifically aiming their efforts at Alberta. Is, is that the general premise? Well, that is what that's what my uh, research has found, that in fact, it's it's less than one percent or roughly one percent of all foundation grants that are addressing climate change that have flowed into uh, the tar sands campaign and and into uh, um, anti pipeline activity in Canada. Almost all of the foundation spending related to climate change globally is about uh, science, technology, innovation, um, electrification, uh, all of the things, the transition that has to happen. That's where almost all of the funding has gone. To the extent that it has flowed into the uh, into organizations, local organizations in countries around the world. And like I say, it's always um, smeared wherever this happens. But largely this is done um, not so much to target any individual programs uh, or, or objectives, but to amplify local voices of climate activists. That is the objective. Sandy, I'm looking here right now. People can check out nationalobserver.com. Uh, your piece back in October, it's, it's been widely referenced. I believe people that are talking about this, a database dismantling of Jason Kenney's foreign funding conspiracy theory. Now, I want to get into this with you. Now, now people can obviously read it in its entirety at nationalobserver.com. But but what are what are some of the this kind of the key points? Where do we need to begin here? People, you know, typically I'd say at the water cooler, but nobody's hanging out at the water cooler these days at the virtual water cooler. What are some of the key points people need to keep in mind? Well, number one, Alberta is not being specifically targeted. Um, Alberta is one of many areas where funding, uh, where foundations that are focusing on climate change are spending, but they have not particularly targeted Alberta. Um, They're spending almost like about 0.5 of of 1% of their total foundation grants are going into activities of this kind. Uh, The control and direction of the funding is, uh, it's being controlled and directed in Canada by Canadians. Uh, Most of the organizations that have been, that have, applied for and received grants in this program, most of their money comes from Canadians. It doesn't come from outside sources. And overwhelmingly, uh, the oil and gas industry is like spectacularly better resourced than these small organizations are. I look to Imperial Oil Canada, for example, which is foreign controlled by Exxon. Um, Exxon itself has derived, I think, something like uh, in the last Uh, in the decade prior to my article, I believe it was something like $16 billion. billion. That's one company in uh, dividend payments alone. So the, 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 the oil and gas industry is vastly more foreign controlled than the charitable sector or the nonprofit sector. The, the volume of resources and the volume of assets is, is there is no comparison and nobody Nobody that I know of has done a deep dive into um, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and and these uh, and the uh, foreign controlled um, uh, oil and gas sector generally. You mean with regards to who's funding cap? Is that what you're talking about? Well, just the just the amount. You know, what is the budget? What is the lobbying, marketing, promotion, uh, legal budget? I would, you can't say that, oh, this is such a huge amount of money that is going to uh, climate activists without comparing, well, well, what are the resources and what is the funding that is going into industry or, 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 or politicians, donations, political donations? Yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've uh, often thought in, with people talking specifically about uh, the province of Alberta's uh, war room, the energy war room, the Canadian Energy Center, uh, the Allen Inquiry and, and some of the other initiatives, uh, some of the other expenditures, let's call them what they are. Um, if that should not be handled by uh, an industry advocacy group like CAP, um, with regards to the, the publicly funded war room that Albertans will spend $30 million a year on, the Allen Inquiry, $3.5 million a year, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think ultimately uh, this could 
serve to be or is it serving to be a self-inflicted wound? I mean, is, is Alberta, you know, the other day when when Jason Kenney is uh, calling for economic sanctions against the United States on Joe Biden's first day in office um, and he starts talking about line three and line five, these two pipelines. I know a lot of people were going, oh, geez, please don't draw attention to those pipelines. Those are important pipeline projects. Could Alberta be screwing itself over here with all this? Well, that's the, that is, if there's one big takeaway, I think that it's the Premier Kenny has done um, incalculable damage to the reputation of, of Alberta and to the oil and gas industry uh, outside the province in Canada and, and in the United States. I mean, he, I think he's way more interested in finding enemies than finding solutions. Uh, it, it, this is, this seems to be all about uh, political combat and not about solving the very real and serious. And by the way, just devastating problems that face the Alberta economy because it doesn't matter really what happens with the tar sands campaign. It doesn't really what matter what happens with Canadian climate activists. This is a now a global phenomenon. The the uh, the money is is draining out, hemorrhaging out of the resource sector and going into renewable uh, renewable energy projects around the world. And we see that every day. Look at GM just the other day announcing yeah. that they will go all to EV. This is a worldwide phenomenon. This is a t- this is a tsunami, a tsunami that is facing Alberta. So what is the premier's solution to that? Yeah, it's it, that's that's a wild story, by the way. General Motors uh, announcing essentially that it'll, it'll manufacture nothing but uh, electric vehicles by 2035. I mean, that that's 14 years from not to state the obvious, Sandy. That's 14 years from now. I can look. I look you, back 14 years. That's not that long ago. Well, you you and me both, Ryan. That was like yesterday in in, yeah. in our world, wasn't that? We don't even want to go there, but. Um, uh, this is going to happen. There's an energy revolution, an absolute revolution. It is happening. It is it is happening now. It is um, the public has no real conception. BlackRock, one of the, the largest uh, um, private equity financers in the world, is has is divesting. The money is flowing, is hemorrhaging out of the oil and gas and fossil fuel sector, um, and into. Uh, renewable energy solutions and we know that the market is there for it the public wants that this is this is uh this is the massive untold story and where is the premier of alberta to deal with this sandy you know people will say and i guarantee it because i've had these conversations many times or you know you get feedback on an interview like this I guarantee you and I will both see it. We'll be tagged on Twitter later today when I push this interview out and, and people will say, well, well, what do you suggest? You know, you think Alberta should just take it? You think we should just lie down and take it? At least Jason Kenney's willing to fight for us. What would you say to those people? Where is the solution? What is the, what do what is their solution to the fact that this global phenomenon is happening? And if the oil and gas industry dies, where is Alberta? You know, there are renewable solutions. You look at Texas right now, um, what's going into Austin, the, the, the massive, massive investment that is going into Texas in renewables, renewable energy. Alberta could have that. Alberta could be part of that revolution. There are jobs, there are profits, there is, there, there's money to be made, there's gold in them, there hills. Why isn't the premier of Alberta chasing that? Sandy, this is, uh, I mean, ultimately when it all comes down to it, th- th- there, there are undeniable forces at work. And whether that's reiterated itself to people, you know, with, with you know, sort of the, the epiphany that Joe Biden is not, the onus is not on President Joe Biden to, to worry about Alberta uh, or Alberta's premier. The world is going a certain way. Investment is going a certain way. You mentioned General Motors. Industry is going a certain way. Do you perceive the federal government? Let, let's let's acknowledge the federal government does have some role in this. Uh, what does the federal government's role look like? Well, I think that um, the federal government, to a certain extent, during the Trump administra- administration, was kind of isolated. And of course, the federal government is very anxious. It's been supporting the TMX pro. 
project. It, it bought that pipeline. It wants to see that, that project go forward. It has been supporting, I believe, as much as it can, getting, getting those projects up and, and going that's under construction right now in British Columbia. I can drive over and, and, and see um, the work at the port. Um, but I think that I think that the inclination of the Trudeau government would probably be to go uh, to be um, in the Biden camp in, as far as uh, enabling this green revolution that is that, that is well underway. Uh, the EU is 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 pressing forward with this. Um, you know, th this is going to be the international standard. Uh, very soon, and and by the way, China is also pushing forward with um, with electrification and with renewable energy sources. So the, this is part of a, an international world, and um, I think that the the federal government is their inclination is very much to be on side with that, but they do want to see the TMX project completed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For obvious reasons. Uh, Sandy Garasino, uh, a lawyer, uh, former Crown prosecutor, journalist. You can read her work, in including you said you're publishing later today, right? Nationalobserver.com. Yes. So we'll be able to read more on this before I let you go. Um, are you familiar with with um, Room Raider on Twitter, like rate my Skype room or Room Raider? Are you familiar with this Twitter account? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So um, you, I, I just checked in on our live chat to see where people are at on this issue. And there are some very serious and, and you know, uh, intuitive comments. And then a whole bunch of people are trying to figure out what's going on with that painting behind you. Um, oh, a, a the couple, painting. Yeah. A couple of viewers are giving you a nine out of ten on their own personal Room Raider here. They, <laughs> they think you got a good setup. Can you tell us about the painting? painting that is uh, so my husband is is of south asian descent and uh, we have family in india and this is a uh, a very well known indian contemporary artist in um based out of delhi there you go sandy garasino thanks so much for your time your insight today we appreciate it thank you so much you bet uh, again nationalobserver.com is where you can read sandy's work uh back in october of 2019 she published check this out sam can we can we put this up on screen here this uh what's on my screen this is part of her report back from october of 2019 this gives you a sense as well of of where canada fits in here so so they're talking about spending uh this is from candidat i want to give you the source so they're talking here uh let me go back here uh, since 2009 hundred thousand charitable foundations uh ngo funders have granted $700 billion to recipient organizations worldwide. This uh, investment uh, or, you know, the fight against, uh, let's say, let, let's say the, the fight for the planet. We can frame it however we like. But you look at where these investment dollars have gone, almost $3 billion to the United States, uh, over $800 million uh, committed to the EU, $624 million to China, $498 million to India, uh, 51 million to Canada. So that that's less than half of of what was spent uh, in all of Africa. It's about a third, well, a little more than a third Southeast Asia. You get it. You know, a little a little over a quarter of what was spent in Latin America. So it gives you a good sense of what we're talking about. Uh, we'll get to your comments on this. As a matter of fact, I mean, some of them now it's it's interesting. I'm I'm curious to know where you would take this or where this is landing with you. You know, um Michelle's talking about wind turbines says, imagine what we could collect in energy along the QE2. Others of you are pointing out, and quite rightfully so, you're saying General, Man uh, General Motors, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're mentioning that, uh, you know, that by 2035, nothing but EVs, but, but a lot of you are saying that GM's like way behind a lot of the other auto manufacturers, right? You're saying that there, there are a ton of auto manufacturers that announced this years ago that they're on an accelerated timeline uh, Gilles here says, you know, GM's lagging the overall industry. M most foreign car makers have planned to move much, much quicker than that. I saw some of you say that Jaguar has plans. and pl I, I wouldn't trust a Jaguar running on gasoline, let alone an EV Jaguar. You can <laughs> well, maybe that's the solution they've been waiting for. <laughs> that might be it. There's oh. only a couple cars that I would, there's only a couple auto manufacturers I wouldn't even consider buying used, and a Jaguar is one of them. <laughs> Never buy a used Jaguar. Maybe those old V12s. Those are beautiful, but I'm not sure. Uh, you can tell we don't have a Jaguar sponsorship. Uh, we're going to get to the news in just a couple of minutes, and then it is Meet in the Middle Mondays with V12. Tor Marciano and Janice Irwin. Very much looking forward to that. This is a perfect time right now. Uh, talking about vehicles, you want to know what's new when it comes to the Jeep and Dodge lineup. 2021 is a huge year, and at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge, they've got you covered. They're right on top of the latest selection. As a matter of fact, you want to see the best of what that Jeep lineup looks like. You're not going to find a better selection than you will in St. Albert 
and Sherwood at those two Dodge dealerships, that brand new one in St. Albert. Absolutely beautiful. They've got that Grand Cherokee with seven seats for your growing family, plus the Grand Wagon here. But they've also got the fuel-efficient and friendly Jeep Compass, too. They're going to work to earn your business. Make sure you go see Scott and his team there. Also wanted to let you know that the team at Dairy Queen has sent their most sincere thanks for a very successful January when it came to that Dilly Bar promotion, it is officially declared closed. That's right, the two-for-one Dilly Bar promotion declared closed for now. The six Alberta locations in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, though, excited to see your business and keep telling them that you're real talkers when you're at the counter. I hear from the owners directly. They love it. Their staff thinks it's amazing. We're building this connection. Love that with the team at DQ. Sam, let's take a look at what's making headlines today. Well, uh, these stories have been popping up across Canada, across the United States as well. Of course, a church uh, just west of Edmonton holding a packed service yesterday morning, Sunday morning, despite being ordered closed after continued violations of provincial COVID-19 rules. We're talking about the Grace Life Church of Edmonton, a few minutes west of the city in Parkland County. RCMP cruisers were there on site yesterday. Uh, parishioners, people attending the services, laughing, driving past the cops, honking their horns. Alberta Health and Health Services inspectors there. About 300 people were there. That's more than the 15% capacity limit. Families walking from the packed parking lot into the church. No masks anywhere. The church is not offering comment to reporters. People have a lot of questions on this. Want to let you know that coming up on Wednesday here on the show, uh, we're excited to welcome uh, Chrissy Stroop, uh, who's done a lot of work here on evangelical communities and pandemic rules, and, and that's going to be coming up again a Wednesday morning uh, right here on the show, uh, 9 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Mountain Time. You won't want to miss that. Also keeping an eye on a story, uh, the Prime Minister's office, internal emails are surfacing showing that there's been some pretty significant frustration between the PMO and the Public Health Agency of Canada. Now get ready for more and more of these stories as journalists continue to dig uh, issues advisors for the Prime Minister have, have written to colleagues in public health saying, hey, listen, we're not aware of a, a lot of the, the guidelines that are coming down, essential workers, PPE, uh, even advisors for Deputy PM Christian Freeland, who was on this show in emails suggesting that, you know, there's been inadequate consultation with industry. So it, a peek behind the curtain here on some of the challenges faced by the PMO, by public health, and trying to find synergy there. And stateside, CNN taking a look at those who were arrested and charged after that insurrection, that domestic terror attack on the U.S. Capitol. It turns out that active military personnel and veterans are overrepresented. In fact, when it comes to court proceedings, 21 of the 150 individuals on record, that's almost 15%, are current or former members of the U.S. military. Obviously, cause for concern. Uh, you can go to CNN.com for more on that information, on that story. Two of them arrested in the Army, two National Guardsmen, 17 veterans, six Army, eight Marines, two in the Navy, one in the Air Force. So, interesting bit of data there. Well, this conversation has been brewing for a while. I threw a tweet out there a while ago, uh, s simply... Um, well, well, toying with the idea, playing with the idea, speculating on what people might find to be an appropriate way to pay for health care in the province. And so I tweeted this out. Uh, someone reached out to me and said, uh, Alberta health care. Remember when we had to pay for it? And I said, yeah, well, here's my controversial opinion. Bring back Alberta health premiums. Now, I, I tweeted it at 3.42 p.m. on January 22nd. It was kind of, a, kind of a lazy afternoon, I remember. It was a Friday, and I, Sam's giggling here in the corner because he knows what happened. It was like I, it was like I threw a, 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 a jerry can of gasoline on a smoldering fire, and all of a sudden, things went nuts. Yeah, you do that a lot. <laughs> but this one was that's, unintended. That's that's my that, that that's my take on that. Is is you you look at Twitter and you see a little you, you see a little ember burning and, and sometimes yes. you're just kind of like you know I got this cup of moonshine here that I kind of want to chuck on. <laughs> hey, nice <laughs> reference. Uh, a past episode of Real that's Talk called reference. A callback. That's a callback. There you go. We should have two points for anybody who can name this specific conversation before. <laughs> Regardless, uh, people start snapping. 
Uh, and 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 you know if you if you take it back, Sam, let me show you here the evidence. Uh, you can you can see I had my comment right at the top there. I'm going to get in the weeds here a little bit because I got ratioed. Anytime your comments outnumber your likes, you are being ratioed. And so 372 comments. That was, that like, was that's a t- not a big ratio. It was a head to head. Yeah, you're right. It was it, really head to head. It's a head to head ratio. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, can, can you get quasi ratioed or subtly or somewhat ratioed? Oh, I don't know the weeds of this. We need I to think, get like a Twitter expert on for that. I think you're either getting ratioed or you're not. Uh, so there were some some thoughtful comments. Uh, some people said, Ryan, I think it's a great idea. Some people said, you know, I, I remember back to when I had to pay healthcare premiums and I remember it being a real struggle. Um, you know, times were difficult for me at the time. I was maybe a single parent. I had lost my job or I was a student or whatever the case may be. And I have, I have negative uh, recollections of that. And, and I, would, I would encourage you um, to, to find another perspective on this. There were those types of comments. And then there were comments like, why do you hate poor people and want them to die? And I kind of went, oh, boy, OK. Uh, but where it really got interesting was when a current MLA in Alberta, an elected official for the official opposition NDP and a former senior ranking advisor for the former Wild Rose Party, uh, a conservative political party in Alberta came together in agreement, both of them acknowledging that they thought that my idea was terrible. And so I thought, well, that's kind of neat. I don't mind being piled on. It comes with the territory, but it's pretty neat that that somebody way over here on the, I shouldn't say way over, somebody over here on the political spectrum and somebody over here on the political spectrum, for those of you listening on the podcast or, or live streaming audio on Mixer, my hands are about two feet apart, that they would agree on something. And it gave me hope. It gave me reason to believe that maybe people on different teams or people from different tribes could actually work together to determine best practices and the best political ideas, the best policy for us as a population. After all, isn't that what this is all about? I'm thrilled they've both agreed to join us here on the show. Janice Irwin is the NDP MLA for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. Uh, she serves as the deputy opposition whip, the critis, uh, critic for status of women and LGBTQ2S plus issues. Um, I think it's fair to describe Janice as a rising star within the official opposition NDP, making rising. her real talk debut this morning. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Good to have you here. Vitor Marciano is a, a strategist uh, who's been involved in, in small C conservative politics for more than 30 years Uh, having been a campaign manager many times, national policy chair for the Conservative Party of Canada, executive director of Wild Rose and the press secretary to two Alberta leaders of the opposition, including Brian Jean. A Vitor, an immigrant who came to Alberta from Portugal as a four-year-old, has been pretty much a lifelong Edmontonian uh, and one of my favorite guys to hit a patio with. Vitor, welcome to the show. It's good to have you. It's just a pleasure to be here. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, I I have no idea where this is going to go. And I'm grateful that the two of you are here along for the ride. Um, Let me let me first of all ask you this, though. Um, I I was I said, you know, we'll call this meet in the middle Monday. I said, you've got somebody on the left and somebody on the right and they agree on something. I'm going to ask you both this question. Janice, am I am I already starting off on the wrong foot if I start using phrases like left and right? Or do we have to acknowledge that that's the reality? Well, hey, I mean, Ryan, obviously, I, I'm a new Democrat, and uh, I have no no qualms about uh, sharing my values and beliefs. But I have to tell you, Ryan, like, you know, over the past number of months, nonstop, I've had folks all over the province reach out to me who've said things like, listen, uh, I've never voted NDP in my life. Uh, I've been a strong conservative a UCP supporter and I'm behind you and your team and Rachel Notley. So, you know, I'm seeing Albertans, uh, they're, they're coming behind us and they're not looking at labels. They're looking at folks who are going to fight for them in the legislature. But Vitor, uh, in, in this case, labels to a certain degree fit. In, in other words, I want to establish that, that you and Janice probably wouldn't agree on a, on a whole bunch, although I don't want to put words in your mouth. Would you acknowledge that? Uh, that's fair, but I think sometimes people exaggerate the differences. Um, one of the things I used to do when I was back at the ledgers, occasionally I'd d- teach the uh, the grade six class that, that they come through for um, a week at the ledge. They do classes at the ledger. And I'd explain to them that the, 
that the differences between the opposition and the government were probably in the range of seven to 10%. We, we agreed on 90 to 93% of the things that needed to be done, a lot of the important things. And when we got into differences, it was oftentimes a disagreement on how you solve a problem that hopefully both sides agree is a problem. Um, so there's a left and there's a right, but it's not as, as stark and as scary as the last couple of years have made it seem. Um, you know, it, it, th there's space for agreement. There's space for at least agreeing on identifying the problems, if not necessarily the solutions. There's, I'm, I'm still hopeful about our polity in general. Okay, well, hope is good. And we want to we want to we want to showcase and manifest hope here. Um, so I want to give both of you an opportunity to pile on a little bit. Don't hold back. Uh, throw your strongest punches, Janice. You go first because you started this whole thing. Uh, when I when I threw out you know controversial opinion, bring back Alberta health premiums. If I remember correctly, your your tweet response, your Twitter response to me was just no, Ryan, no. And I think about a th I think about a thousand people thought that was a good tweet. About a thousand people <laughs> liked it, and it and it of course put that uh, you know pretty prominently into the eye of political watchers. So uh, so I'll let you go first. Uh, we don't have to we don't have to write and we don't have to present an essay on this. But why do you think healthcare premiums are a bad idea when it comes to paying for what we spend the most on? Yeah, great question. And I like yeah I like that all I had to say was no and. Uh, <laughs> you know, everybody supported me. I yeah. just, I think, you know, Friday afternoon, I wasn't really looking for a Twitter fight either. I just, <laughs> I just needed to call you out. So yeah. uh, thanks for your graciousness on that. But yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, I've talked about the fact that I hear from folks all over the province. I represent Edmonton Highlands Norwood here, where we have, you know, just a diverse range of people. Um, we have some of the highest rates of child poverty, as an example. We have a lot of folks who are struggling with, uh, with homelessness. So Every day, um, I see the impacts of uh, this UCP government downloading costs onto onto families, and healthcare premiums are an additional cost. And we know, you know, I I, I I'm not old enough to remember exactly how healthcare premiums uh, affected folks, but I know from even just reading the Twitter comments, um, there were people who were really hit hard by that additional cost. And like I said, we've seen it with uh, tuition, we've seen it with property taxes, we've seen uh, how just all these little costs very much add up. And I mean, again, I'm a strong supporter of a public healthcare system. Folks shouldn't have to pay to get quality public health care. Okay, I, and I will circle back on that because we've, we've got to, folks are going to pay one way or another. The question is really just how do we pay for it, right? And maybe maybe we'll be able to solve that over the next half hour or so. Vitor, on, on principle, uh, you know, if, if you were to make your opening statement here, why, why did you think that my idea was a terrible idea? Because it doesn't tax people evenly and it's most damaging to the people who are the ones you most want to encourage and help. Um, the, the way the system was structured, um, basically everybody who was unionized, everybody who worked for the public sector, everybody who worked for large corporations had an easier time paying that tax. People who were poor or who were lower middle class or who were independent contributors to the economy or worked for small employers, they all had a much harder time paying that tax. So they, it wasn't taken off on their source deductions. It wasn't negotiated in a way in collective bargaining. And the net effect is that you had a tax that really about the only people who paid it were, you know, construction workers, well-paid retail clerks, um, you know, people working for small business were the only ones that paid for it. Everybody in the government had it looked after uh, everybody in unions had it looked after. And if they didn't have it completely looked after, they had it looked after through source deductions. Um, they didn't have to set aside money for that quarterly whopping check to send. And normal everyday people, the ones you want to think about serving the, the most as a government, those were the ones who had to sort of figure out how to set aside, you know, 700, 1,000, 1,500. I mean, it got pretty high at the end every quarter to send a check to the government. And that's just not a well-structured tax system when only certain people are being pinged by it. I do agree with that. On, on principle, how can you disagree with that? 
now this conversation would be meaningless if we didn't come up with alternative solutions. So, so Janice, let's, let's come at this from a different angle. I mean, you know, part of your job, here's the thing. I think a lot of people, and I've been guilty of saying this before too, people will say it's easy to oppose. It's difficult to govern, right? Like it's easy to sit on the opposition bench and say, this is, and both of you have worked in opposition. Vitor has as well. You can sit there and say, this is a terrible idea. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And, and then voters, you know, on the doorsteps will say to you, or in zoom meetings will say to you, well, what would you do? differently so janice we know that we're operating at a deficit even COVID aside we're operating at a deficit we know we spend more than 20 billion dollars we spend approximately not exactly little less than half of our provincial budget is on health so we know we're gonna have to pay for it somehow people say you know healthcare should be free someone's paying for it so so what do you think should be the foundational principle upon which we build our payment structure <laughs> Well, I mean, again, I'm certainly I'm certainly not an expert, but I do want to t touch on a couple of things you said. First of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, in the opposition, our job, of course, it's it's to oppose, but more importantly, and I find it's it's more important than ever right now. It our job is to propose um, because you're right. You know, there is that easy criticism that. Um, all we're doing is is being negative and we're being critical, um, but. Absolutely not. We've shown in so many ways uh, that we we are being propositional. And so on the healthcare piece, you know, Ryan, I wasn't a part of uh, Rachel Notley's government, but I I watched uh, from afar uh, with pride about the fact that you know she was able to um, you know under under uh, Sarah Hoffman as our as our healthcare minister at the time, you know they were very much able to maintain services and contain costs while still having a strong public healthcare system. And what are some of the ways they did that? Well, for instance, they worked with healthcare workers. They worked with doctors. You know, uh, I think we can all agree, it's, it's not a good strategy to pick fights with doctors in the middle of a pandemic. And Ryan, it's about priorities, right? You know, we just had uh, more conversations about the energy inquiry. We've got this war room that's spending $30 million a year on who knows what. I mean, there are ways to effectively fund our public health care system. Okay, so for you, it's a it's a question of 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 an audit. It's a spending audit. It's it's finding efficiencies. Uh, am I fairly characterizing what you're saying? Finding efficiencies, absolutely. Again, uh, prioritizing things, keeping costs under control. Again, I think you you can talk to healthcare workers um, who uh, who worked under both Premier Notley and Premier Kenny, and the difference they find. They found that healthcare was adequately funded. They found that morale was was much higher. They found that they were supported by their government. Stephanie's watching live on, on our chat. She says, I think we should charge uh, for health care for families that make a combined income of more than $90,000. She says, I think kids should be free. Uh, Vitor, I think you're going to love this comment. Mr. Fancy Pants is watching and says, did I just see somebody with the title conservative strategist agree that flat taxes are regressive? Did Mr. Fancy Pants see what he thinks he saw? No, because if anything, the the the, the health care tax wasn't a flat tax. It, it, it didn't apply to all people equally. It wasn't administered in a way that that was just taxing dollars. It was administered in a way that provided massive advantages to some people and not to others. Um, Ryan, I'm kind of at a disadvantage here in the sense that I don't speak for any government right now. I'm, I'm not part of the UCP government. Janice is going to defend her party's positions. Um, I can comment a little bit on on what Rachel did in, in from 2015 to 2019 because I don't think they were particularly successful. Um, if we want to talk about healthcare, then we've got to stop doing little games with talking about 30 million dollars for the war room. The healthcare system will burn through 30 million dollars over the course of your show today, Ryan. Yeah. Just like one example, right? Right. I understand, but but we got to talk about the really big elephant. Let's not get distracted by rabbit tracks. And, and the really big elephant is the fact that we've been a wealthy province. And while we were a wealthy province, we created a government that we can only afford when we're wealthy. We created a health system that we can only afford when we're wealthy. It's possible that over the next little while, we won't be as wealthy as we used to be. So we need to figure out how to pare down that system, get that system costing as much per capita as, as say that, that horrible third world hellhole, British Columbia. Right. And, um, 
you know, if, if we can get our costs down to levels that are comparable to the other big provinces in Canada, we'll go a long way towards solving our problems. Now, the way to get our costs down is to do something radical that uh, neither the NDP nor uh, the UCP have done. Um, you know, I'm going to give you my best idea on how to save money in healthcare. You got to bring the doctors and the nurses to the table. And you have to tell them that for every dollar we save, we're going to make sure that a nice, healthy percentage of that goes back into their pockets. You, you have to take advantage of people's instinct to look after themselves. And you've got to create capitalist style incentives to help everybody in the healthcare system work together to shrink the cost of the healthcare system. Now, I'm a wild roser. I'm not a UCPer. Um, I'm not a PCer. I think one of the most horrible things we've done with our healthcare system is centralize it. Uh, I don't understand why some conservatives think that centralizing the most expensive part of government is going to get you better results. Uh, we tried that in the Soviet Union. We tried that in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, you can't find a good enough central planner to make the difference. So it becomes important that you find a way to take advantage of people's competitive instincts, to take advantage of people's sense of innovation, to try to drive down costs. And we've got to go working on that. And there's there are other industries that have been able to work with their critical human resources to get them involved in that and to head in that direction. But I mean, it'll take a decade um, at least because it's such a big system. It, you, know, you can't turn a ship this size quickly, uh, but it has to start with encouraging competition and not monopolies. It has to start with respecting the doctors and nurses. It has to start with creating systems that reward them for signing up for changes that save us money in the long run. There's a lot of things that need to happen. None of these things Janice is going to talk about because she wants to get elected next time. And if I were advising them, you know, if I were giving the NDP advice on getting elected next time, I'd say, don't talk about these complicated, risky things. They'll just scare people. In Canada, we don't talk about changing healthcare policy. Governments that do, don't get reelected. Well, and Vitor, let me just say, okay. and, and I'll let, and I want Janice, I'll, Janice, I, I'm going to hand the microphone I'd over like for a hundred percent. Absolutely. <laughs> and Vitor, I'm like, I, I, I'm full of all kinds of great ideas uh, because I don't, none of them are actually going to be put into practice and I don't have to get elected. So I can throw them all out there. Um, you know, I can talk about a sales tax. I think it's a great idea. Um, my trade off for a sales tax would be a flat income tax. I know that people are going to nail me to the cross for that one. They're not going to like that one at all. Uh, some people are going to come at me hard for just saying nail to the cross. They're going to be ticked off at me for that. I'm going to infuriate everybody by the time this hour is done. But I will say this. I think probably some of Janice's biggest supporters are going to take real issue, Vitor, even with you invoking the word capitalism in conversation on healthcare. Right, Janice? That's probably where you want to start. Well, you know, I, I what I would like to do is, I, you know, Vitor talked about a radical idea, and I, I'd like to talk about the radical idea of uh, investing in people. I think there are some ways that we can uh, address healthcare costs by actually being more preventative in our approach. And here's an example, harm reduction, supervised consumption sites. I've got my mug right here, harm reduction saves lives. We've got a, we've got a UCP government right now that um, is not investing in people. They're making short-sighted cuts all over the place that are going to truly balloon costs down the road. Uh, and that's just one example where if you're not looking after the needs of your most vulnerable folks, those costs are going to catch up to you eventually. And so radical idea, let's start investing in people now. And again, we've seen a pattern from this UCP government where they're not willing to do so. Vitor, this, uh, you know, when, when it comes to health care, you have to be, I mean, you, you've been, here's what I find fascinating. Number one, I love that you're not officially affiliated with a political party right now because because you can you can take us behind the curtain and you can tell us about the big bold ideas i mean when you were advising uh when you were press secretary senior advisor to to leaders in official opposition what were some of the ideas that were being bandied about i mean you talk about for example decentralizing health care that would be was it stelmac i'm trying to remember who created the super i can't remember who it was but it, it, it was klein who created 17 of them yeah and then, then stelmac brought it back right 
No, then they headed to nine, and then they headed to one. Yeah. So if so you're got rid of all incentives. Okay. So, but you're you. So you have to be willing to go with the nuclear option here. Totally. So you you turn to AHS and say, congratulations, AHS, you're purchasing and legal. And we're going back to regional boards and hello, regional boards, be innovative. Stop looking at, um, stop looking at patients as a cost center. Look at them as an opportunity because we're going to pay you on per patient services. Become efficient at it because we're going to tell you that, wait a second, your cataracts cost too much. So let me give you an example from 20. 10, it might not be valid anymore because the, um, the the circumstances and the billing have changed. In 2010 in Alberta, Calgary and Edmonton used to do cataracts differently. All cataract surgeries in Edmonton were done completely in the public system, and they cost about $1,000 an eye. In Calgary, they were done completely by private contractors, and they cost about $500 an eye. Because the government was afraid of sending too much money to government contractors, they wouldn't actually fund enough cataract surgeries in Calgary so that there was a long waiting list in Calgary. In Edmonton, because it was all being done through the public system and in public hospitals, um, we weren't restricting it. So there was a much shorter waiting list. The correct solution to this is to say, hmm, let's take the Calgary model and move it to Edmonton so that you can get your cataract surgeries done in a private clinic. Let's pay less and take the money that we save and pay for more cataract surgeries in Calgary so that we could get a higher number of cataract surgeries across the entire province. Um, these are things that sort of needed to be done that, you know, but that's an example of it. You need to, you need to encourage competition between the regions. You need to encourage competitions between the CEOs of the different health boards Back when we had nine health boards, the most innovative health board in Alberta was Chinook. It was Lethbridge. They were doing more with less money than any other health board. What I just, happened to them? They, they got rolled into AHS and boom. Yeah, but I mean, and I'm looking at, and, and this is apples and oranges and, and Janice, we're being, I'm being completely unfair to you, let's be honest, because you, you, you're probably going to have, I, I wonder if, if like, uh, you, you've got Notley's team just behind the camera right now, holding up whiteboards saying you, you can go here. That is a no fly <laughs> zone. Do not say this, do not comment on this, but because I, I want to be very clear, you're not speaking here on behalf of the official opposition, unless you state that you are correct. But, but well, I, but, and I'm not like Ryan, I love, you know, you were you were you had those experts on coal on the other day and you said like listen I, explain it to me at a at a grade six level yeah, like you know yeah. I, I'm one of those people where if I, I like clearly Vitor he, I, I'm not going to dispute that he knows a whole lot more about uh, some of the past intricacies of the healthcare system so you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna weigh in and I'm gonna take his advice too and say you know uh, take his strategist advice and and not to not be too too vocal on this issue, but um, it you know I'm glad we're having the conversation. But I think we've seen uh, countless times uh, if, from the people of Alberta that they one of the principles they hold dearly is a is a strong public healthcare system. We saw that with Bill 30 that the UCP rammed through last year. Uh, countless letters, emails, calls to my office saying. Keep fighting for public health care, Janice. Your team is doing amazing. We believe in a strong public health care system. So this conversation, yeah, we can have it. But I, I'm telling you, Albertans are telling us that, uh, uh, that yes, they want us to contain costs. They want us to maintain services but they want that to, to be through a public health care system. Yeah, for sure. And, and and then there are also different interpretations of what that means. Um, I, I wanted to throw something back in front of the two of you, and I will in a second, but, but I want to say this. Vitor's got this idea of, Vitor, I don't know if you specifically said nine boards again, but but decentralizing health care. And then I look at, at some of the moves, and again, apples and oranges, but some of the conversation, um, you know, some some of the negotiation, even I would imagine behind the scenes around, for example, post secondary institutions and their boards. There's there's talk of a, a so called super board for post secondary. Vitor, you think it might be difficult to move it back to break down a centralized system? And I mean, people would perceive that, don't you think, to be a whole bunch more spending? At the risk of having the Kenny government dislike me more than they do, uh, they're instinct to centralize their instinct to say we need to group things together bigger and move it all under one smaller set of bureaucrats you know higher quality central planners will get us a better result is is a mistake 
uh, honest to goodness, it's a mistake. The correct approach is to say, we're going to attach the dollars to the patient. We're going to attach the dollars to the student. We're going to let them choose. And we're going to turn to the sellers and say, yeah, that, that price is too high. So-and-so does it better. So you, you need to pull up your socks. Competition is the answer in this. It's not going to a public healthcare monopoly. Now, and, and let's take this back to this public private thing, because I'm a huge believer in public health care in terms of the concept of a single payer. Um, I think we're, we run some risks in Alberta heading down the path of multiple payers and allowing people to have private insurance because we're going to end up with a system that doesn't treat rural and remote Alberta the same way it treats the cities. There's, you know, heading towards a more U.S. style or a more European style healthcare system is dangerous. But Janice and the NDP are disingenuous when they talk about public versus private. About 35% of our healthcare system is private already. Every single one of your family doctors is a small businessman running a corporation, hoping to make a profit out of the money that they get from the government for looking after you. Our hospitals are largely fully public, though we're starting to experiment with having uh, private delivery in the hospital side. Private delivery of services in a single payer system is probably the best answer for getting a mix of high quality healthcare and good results without heading down the path of American healthcare. And having said that, 35% of American healthcare is fully public. You know, more than 35% of US healthcare dollars are spent with Medicare and Medicaid and they're paid for by the US government. So they're, they're not nearly as private as we think we are. You know, they're 35% public, we're 35% private. So the public private divide is not what people think it is. But let me take one further step back. If we want to fix this system, if we want to deal with the fact that it's $22, $23 billion in climbing, and I think it will be much higher after COVID. Yeah. And I think it will be much higher after a COVID system where we become addicted to doing uh, PCR tests to find diseases, because I got warnings for you. 2024, we'll be all out there doing PCR to confirm every single case of the flu, even though we never used to do that before. And the deaths will look scary and the world will change. If we're going to head into that system, we need to get a grip really fast on costs. Janice talked earlier about investing in people. Well, the truth of the matter is that if to make the system work, you have to invest in people to get them to do the right things. Uh, you get, but, but you can do that in a whole bunch of ways that fix the system, probably employ more people, probably not the same mix of people that we have today. You'll probably get cooperation if you invest properly from doctors and moving to a system where most of us only see a doctor when we really need to because the rest of the time we see a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. And doctors become heads of groups of people that look after, pe look after patients that cost a lot less money than the current system. All of these things are radical changes from the model that we're used to having. And we almost need to go back to the early 60s when Medicare showed up and it was a radical change to the healthcare that people had before. No government's gonna say that. You know, Janice, if she wants to get elected, shouldn't talk about that. Um, the, the, the UCP, if they wanna get reelected, probably shouldn't talk about that. But if we actually wanna solve the problem, We've got to talk about fundamentally changing the system because we have created a system that is so big we can't afford it anymore. Janice, you know, one of the things that really jumped out at me in, in the in the almost 400 comments on my tweet and, and, and the conversation that, quite frankly, you and Vitor got going um, was that people do seem to have, at least in a very small and unscientific sample size, um, people that were commenting seemed to be open to, as a matter of fact, there almost seemed to be an onus being placed on on legislators to consider blowing up uh, like what Vitor is talking about, blowing up our, our 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 models of taxation of healthcare delivery. People want to see. I mean, and that's a, a Herculean task. Obviously, um, is is that the type of thing that's unrealistic for elected officials? I mean, where do you where do you, I mean? Does your mind work that way? Do you start thinking? I hate people to say think outside the box because that's in the box. But you know what I'm saying. Does your mind work that way? 
You know, I, yeah, I'm all about um, really looking for solutions and being creative in our approach. But you know, the reality is, I am I'm I'm elected to to represent my constituents and to to listen to to Albertans. And uh, I'm telling you, I, I'm I'm hearing from them all the time that they don't want you know they don't want American style healthcare. Absolutely, they want us to ensure that spending is 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 under control. But again, there are these fundamental values that I'm hearing from folks that they hold dearly and uh, we want yeah we want stability in the healthcare system and we want um uh, you know, we, we need to get through this pandemic, right? We need, uh, we, we need to do, uh, like, uh, we need to support Albertans. And, and unfortunately, this UCP government is not doing a good job of that. So right now, that's our focus, Ryan, is to propose solutions, try to address the inadequacies in the healthcare system, try to reason with the premier and the health minister who have shown that Albertans aren't their priority. And they've shown that throughout the pandemic. Okay, so Vitor pointed out that, that uh, for example, family physicians gps are, are small business persons that's that's a fact and I, I that was reiterated to me as i watched my my dad run his practice for more than 40 years and, and my mom managed the practice and and i know all about that i've seen it in action uh, let me ask you this and and i'm sure that both of you because we found common ground here by the way peter's watching this morning uh, i'm watching our hashtag real talk rj peter says this might be the best conversation so far on real talk period he says, meet in the middle Mondays might actually make me like Mondays. He says, we need to make this a recurring thing. So Vitor and Janice, you're making somebody like Mondays. So there you go. Um, I wonder if you'll see differently on this. I suspect you might. Um, let's say, Vitor, that, that I, uh, and I'm not sure I completely disagree with this. I'm not being devil's advocate here. Uh, we know that Albertans are flying to other jurisdictions, whether it's the U.S., Mexico, whatever, hip replacement, knee replacement, cataract surgery, uh, whatever. Um, let's say that we open up and I, and again, people are gonna say, well, this is two tiered healthcare. Well, yeah. I mean, some, some words aren't necessarily inherently bad to some people. They are. And I, and I think that maybe the two of you will answer this differently, but let's say that, that, a, that a private clinic opens up to do private knee replacement surgeries, but the way that they're priced, that knee surgery is covered. And then they also pay back in that surgeon pays back into the system. In a sense, the private surgery clears a spot in the queue right? Somebody else waiting for surgery doesn't have to wait as long. And two, it eases some of the fiscal, some of the financial burden. In other words, it helps carry the load. Vitor, could you get on board? I mean, I, obviously I'm, I'm describing it at a very surface level, but could you get on board with something like that? I could absolutely get on board with something like that. It, 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 it is in effect, you're taxing private healthcare and you're taxing paying for getting to the front of the line faster. But a system like that would have to be limited. You couldn't make it wide open. You couldn't say go to the French model or the Swiss model or the Croatian model, all, all countries that all have something like this, um, because you need to have a system that doesn't draw and suck all of the doctors and all of the healthcare workers out of rural and small town Alberta into the big cities so that they can go chase the money that's available to them in a private system. So it's really important to regulate and to create the, the, the right size circumstance on it. Um, I think we would be well served by having anybody who can afford to pay for their own knees or hips or cataracts leave the system, use their own dollars to get faster service and clear a spot for somebody who can't afford it. I think that's that's a good thing. Um, it it might not seem fair, but there's lots of things in life that aren't fair. Janice, and is this is is this a non-starter for you from your perspective? I listen, I, and again, I, I get, I understand that, that we've already got private elements of our healthcare system, absolutely. Um, but here's the concern, uh, well, many concerns, but but the main concern is, you know, when we were debating Bill 30 as an example last year, which again uh, allows for more uh, private surgical clinics and whatnot, um, you know, the, this is what the UCP said back to us. They said, we're fear-mongering and that... Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're exaggerating their um, uh, push for American style healthcare and, and just, you know, ask Albertans to trust them. Ryan, let's point to the countless times the UCP has asked Albertans just to trust them and to just be lied to. Uh, we can talk about the environment, we can talk about coal, we can talk about uh, 
education and curriculum, which I'd love to talk about because that's my background, right? I mean, there's countless examples where we've been told to just, just trust them. And so it's a slippery slope. It's concerning. Let's, uh, let's, let's continue to focus, you know, me and the opposition, the NDP, let's continue to focus on um, our constituents, on fighting for them, and absolutely ensuring that we have a strong public health care system for all. Janice, you've touched on something so important, which is that any transformative change uh, requires a government needs to have a minimum level of trust. I think you probably both agree on this, but Janice, I mean, like I, I mean, I tweeted about it. But I'm on the red. People don't trust Jason Kenney. I mean, the, the, le- the least controversial thing I've said all morning is that people don't trust Jason Kenney anymore. I mean, some people would argue that Jason Kenney's lost the moral authority to govern. So, I mean, the trust that this would take, if you started, I, and, 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 you know, I'll go to you first on this, Janice, but both you can answer it. If you were to start saying, hey, listen, we are going to introduce private clinics um, and we're going to introduce a different structure on fee for service or how the money gets back into the system. Uh, if the government doesn't have the trust of the people, uh, there's going to be immediate backlash in the sense that people may not approach an issue as open mindedly as they otherwise, uh, otherwise may have been inclined to do. Absolutely. And, and they've backed themselves into a corner because of their, uh, you know, their, their actions. And, uh, you know, why would Albertans trust them, uh, trust them? I mean, certainly, of course, I'm biased. I don't I haven't trust them from the, from the outset. But when I have longtime conservatives reaching out to me and saying that they're done with the UCP and they're done with Jason Kenney, I think it shows it's, it's been a continued pattern of uh, broken promises of sometimes backtracking on their promises making a decision, trying to push as far as they can, see if Albertans will respond and react. Oh, wait, they did. Okay, we better pull that back. You can see that with Parks as an example. You can see that with coal, right? There's there's all these examples where they're just trying to push and push. And in doing so, they've lost the trust of Albertans and they've got a whole heck of a lot of Albertans riled up and rightly so. Vitor, how important is trust? Trust is important. Um, this government's blown through 20 points of popularity and it hasn't actually made any hard decisions yet. Um, and there are hard decisions coming. Um, the, the, it's an attitude problem. Um, and, and it, and it, and it's made complicated by the, the personalities of the people who are in the positions. And, um, frankly, you know, the opposition that the NDP opposition has done a good job of, of taking advantage of that. Um, even though there are issues where the NDP is being disingenuous, like coal and, we can talk about some of that later on. We should do these more regularly. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I totally agree. We should. But, but this this is the problem. Like this government's been picking fights, and when you pick lots and lots of fights, uh, it's hard to get to solutions, and it's hard to get to solutions in 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 standard ways. You know, if we were just using the old collective bargaining model, where you have to constantly be collective bargaining. Uh, it's hard to get to solutions in transformative ways if you spent all of your time picking fights. Um, I, will, I want to touch on something here. This is uh, uh, throw a bit of a curveball. Janice, I'm going to put you in a tough spot. This is going to be a weird question, weirder than probably any other question you've ever gotten in an interview. Uh, there's a viewer by the name of Megan, and I really appreciate her checking in, but I can't ignore she's she's lambasting me on the live chat. She's now lambasting me on Twitter. She's on all the platforms coming at me hard. Um, she's disappointed in the moderating. She says, I'm not valuing your time. She says, uh, it would be nice to be able to have Janice be able to showcase her perspective as, as evenly. Um, I, I don't feel like I've stepped on your toes. I certainly haven't cut you off. Um, we're going back and forth asking each person questions, but Megan is at my throat. Janice, have I cut you off? Is there anything you want to say? I want to hand over the conch to you. The microphone is yours. No one will interrupt you. Megan is pissed off at me. Janice Irwin, I'm not even going to ask you a question. Have I? Been, I, I she, she, I, she says, I'm not valuing your time. I want you to know how clearly and, 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 and how significantly I value your time, Janice, on this. Hey, you know, uh, thank you, Megan. I, I swear I don't know Megan and I didn't put her up to that. You're not Megan. Fact, That's not your looking. alias. Okay. No, no. And I'm not even looking at the chat or anything. I'm trying to be focused on this, <laughs> yeah, uh, on yeah. this conversation. So no, I appreciate it. And Ryan, you know, listen, one of the things that I find um, is, is a total privilege of uh, being an MLA is, but using my platform 
to amplify others' voices, right? I can I can amplify voices in the legislature and I can also do it on social media. And um, I very much uh, respect the fact that you do the same with your platform. Those three kids you had, or the young people you had on the other day, um, you know, racialized folks who were talking about leaving the province. I mean, these are the types of things that we should all be doing. We should be amplifying those voices that aren't being heard, those folks who might be marginalized. And so, no, I appreciate you. If I wanted to butt in and uh, cut off Vitor, I would have I would have done so. And I will still if we have time. Yeah, I, good. I, well, well, and, and I'd love to actually, as a matter of fact, I would love for this to be a thing. Uh, I mean, this can be, you know, this sort of meet in the middle Mondays thing is pretty beautiful. Um, I know that both of you had commitments, so we agreed to let you go at quarter to 10, which gives us two minutes here now. So, so for now, uh, we didn't even get to the million other things we said we were going to get to um you know i i I said to janice i sent you a private note that i'll now make public i said i want to talk to to, to your rising star status in the party and i said vitor has has advised and managed rising political stars and so we could get his insight on that um but what i'd like to close on is just the observation that that none of us tore our hair out um it'd especially be a shame janice if you did you know that that qua vitor and i can both agree you you put us you put us to shame um but 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 here we are having a reasonable respectful conversation and we see so much evidence i mean the extreme example would be in dc on january 6th but we see so much evidence that may lead or let me say circumstantial evidence that may lead us to believe that these types of conversations this meeting in the middle isn't possible what does even a conversation like this do to you janice well, hey, first of all, I just have to point out the rising star piece. You know, I, I, that's kind of you, but um, honestly, I have an incredible team of colleagues around me. Our leader, Rachel Notley, is just uh, well. Of course, you have to say this. Of course, you have to say no, that. It's, uh, it's true, though. It really is, and I'm, I'm so honored every day to serve in this capacity. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's, it's great that we can have these conversations. You know, I. I, I do talk to people every day who may not support us, who may not have supported us in the past, and we have to have these conversations. Absolutely, it's an important uh, it's important dialogue to engage in, you know. But that being said, you know there are certain things I can't meet in the middle on, you know. As an example, uh, racism. I'm never I'm never going to equivocate on 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 racism or homophobia, right? I mean, so uh, it's certainly we 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 have to talk about the you know talk about the issue that's. Uh, that's at hand, but you're right. I mean, we've seen increased polarization. We've seen um, increased hate and violence. And uh, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to counter that every day. And if I can, as a legislator, if I can, you know, use my words and use my platform uh, to, to 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 stop that, absolutely. That's that's a really powerful um, thing that we can be doing. And there's a lot of work ahead. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not in denial about the the issues that we're facing as a province and and as a country. Janice, uh, while I ask Vitor for his closing remarks, so to speak, uh, we'll take you off camera so you can go get oregano because if oregano does not appear on camera, uh, real talkers are going to lose their damn minds. So would, would you be able to go grab oregano for a second? Yeah, and, and He was hoping you'd ask yeah, for a moment. V- Vitor, this is not a cannabis reference or anything else. Her cat is named oregano. But but what did this exercise do to you, if anything, Vitor? Well, one, I know who oregano is now, and that makes some things make sense. Um <laughs> These are great exercises. Um, and, and Janice is a rising star. She did a good job of staying on her talking points, not getting sucked into the controversial details, um, talking about what matters on this stuff. Having more conversations about what's facing our politics is worthwhile. Having more long form conversations is worthwhile. Um, creating a space where people who are future decision makers or current decision makers can muse safely is worthwhile. We've gotten rid of those things over time, and it and it's a problem, and it ends up resulting in a politics that's all about clash. And I'm, you know, if if you had asked, you know, Janice and I to come on, you know, a few years ago, back when I was representing somebody, we would have done lots of clash, and it would have been an entertaining radio. It's not as meaningful in the long run as having discussions where you explore the the elements of the differences. And like I started off at the very beginning, you know, the, the differences between where we are are seven to 10%. That means we're 90% similar. And that's a lot of good, positive hope for getting things done in the future. Uh, Vitor, I'm looking forward to, I, I, I want to, okay, first of all, but no one's going to be able to focus on anything else we say. Let's just meet oregano here. So Janice, this is, this is like the star of your Twitter and Instagram. Tell us about, tell us who this is. 
You know, uh, he really has taken over. Um, <laughs> like many folks, uh, the pandemic hit and, uh, you know, I live alone and um, I saw many friends getting getting cats and dogs. Unfortunately, I don't have the capacity to take on a dog. And so uh, Second Chance Animal Rescue Society had this fellow oregano at top of their website. And they they said that he was cuddly and friendly. And I thought, I'm in 100%. Aww. So big shout out to uh, to rescue uh, animals if you can. Uh, oh, now he's running away. Um, you know, Please support support those agencies, those organizations that are doing such great work. Because truly, he's he's brought some uh, some joy to my to my life. I love Absolutely. it. And and scars yeah, right. is, scars is such a great cause, such a worthy cause, as you mentioned. Uh, that's Janice Irwin, uh, uh, Vitor Marciano, two personal friends of mine, different political perspectives. Here we are meeting in the middle on a Monday. Uh, Vitor, we'll talk again about the about the journey of conservatism in Alberta some other time. I know both of you have to go. Thank you for this. Thanks for making time for us. Thanks, Thank Ryan. You. Thanks, encourage Peter. you to uh, encourage uh, you uh, at home. Those of you that are listening on the podcast uh, later in the day, watching live on YouTube right now, give both of them a follow. I think you can see probably uh, why I, I've got a ton of respect for both of those individuals. Um, <laughs> I'm just touching down on the on the chat right now, and then and then Megan is Megan's kind of like a bunch of people are celebrating what may I I'm I'm not up to speed. I haven't read the whole thing. Let me be clear. Megan says, "Oh, I got yelled at." <laughs> no, no, Megan. Like I would I. I, I don't know what what you're um, like if you're into uh, why am I immediately going to booze? I'm going to booze because I haven't told Sam this, but but it's the end of dry January. Um, but I haven't told yeah, you this. You made it. You made well, it here's the thing. Oh. Here's the thing. I've decided to roll it into dry February. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's. it's See, here's this is bold, dude. That Sam's disappointed because this is terrible. It's devastating news for the Real Talk beer fridge, which is just. I'm not disappointed. It's I mean, like, it means that I'm the only one drinking out of the beer fridge, it does. And, and, and it makes me feel very yes. self conscious about the amount that I've been depleting this no, shared resource. Drain it. Drain it. <laughs> But I'm into dry. I'm going to do dry February now. So back to Megan. I, do, I said, I don't know why I go straight to the booze. It's because I got booze on my mind. Maybe maybe Megan's a teetotaler, which is great. But I was going to say, Megan, I would I would shake you a martini. I would I would mix you a margarita. I would pour you a beer and we would chat and laugh and have a great time. I want to be very clear. I'm just acknowledging it's real talk. The whole show is real talk. So if someone's ripping me for the style of interview, I want to I want to put that publicly. I'm not the type of host that wants to ignore that kind of like hide to get Sam to delete the con. Oh, somebody thinks I'm doing a lousy job of moderating it no let's let's talk about the elephants in the room let's shine light in the corners let's talk somebody thinks that 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 the uh that the interview lacks uh equitable coverage you know you, you feel like vitor's doing too much talking janice isn't doing enough talking she's being denied an opportunity what do i want to do i'm the type of interview that says i want to say hey some people here feel like you're being denied an opportunity to say what you want to say the microphone's yours that's the style of interview that's the type of interview i want to watch I'm just saying this. It's remarkable that Janice was willing to come on the show. It's quite frankly, if I can say, it's pretty cool that her party allowed her to come on here. She's not the health critic, right? And and here she is talking policy on things like healthcare premiums, taxes, negotiations with doctors and nurses, two tiered health care. I mean, they obviously trust her a lot, but can we acknowledge? Like any other politician, she's got talking points she's going to stick to. And that meant that Vitor is going to freewheel a little bit more and Janice isn't. She's she's displaying, in my opinion, discipline. And so that's why her answers aren't as long. It's, I mean, I've been interviewing people for 20 years, right? It's just a little bit of a different thing. And then people saying, you know, Vitor, I, I saw here, Vitor is condescending, saying that Janice did a good job. Vitor is a strategist. Right. Vitor is the guy. Vitor is the guy behind the guy to quote Vince Vaughn and Swingers, one of the greatest movies of all time. He's the guy behind the guy. His whole career has been, for the most part, the guy behind the guy. So when he's saying Janice did a good job, it's as though he, had, for example, if he was advising her, coaching her, setting her up with talking points and turning her loose in an interview, his assessment is that she did a good job. That's not mansplaining. It's not talking. Now you're going to say Ryan's mansplaining, mansplaining. In my opinion, that was a wonderful exchange of ideas between two people. Is Carrie Tate ready to go? We're going to run out of time before we even check in with uh, one of the senior journalists. She's, in my mind, uh, one of the most talented journalists uh, that's working for the Globe and Mail. She's out of the Calgary Bureau. Carrie Tate has agreed to take some time right now to talk to us about vaccines. Why don't we just roll in hot into that? Uh, Carrie, welcome to Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us this morning. 
I think we got you on mute here. It means I get to use the sign here, which I've been looking forward to using this sign. But I think we got you now. There we go. Can there we go. Ready? Good morning. Happy yeah. Monday. How are you doing? I'm the same. I'm the same as I've been for 10 months. <laughs> you know, like, so, sometimes you check the calendar. You go like, what day is it? It's March. It's March. <laughs> How have you been holding up through all this? Like generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. The same as everybody. I think like there are days that are just really terrible. And I think we really are getting better at saying, how's today? Terrible. <laughs> Rather than going, oh, it's really good. Good. Yeah. I'm busy. How are you? Yeah. I think we're really getting better at just admitting that this kind of sucks and that's okay. Yeah. And you know what? I think that uh, it, it's for a lot of people, the vaccine has been that thing that we've been looking ahead to, right? Like once we get the vaccine, then once everything, the everything's going to be okay. Now you've been covering the story. You've been following the story. Uh, is, is it proving to be uh, the impact that people had hoped it would be, or is it way too early to say? I think my pessimism has really paid off for me is that I didn't think we would have a vaccine this quickly. And so I'm not that disappointed yet with this where people are jumping off cliffs on it's been such a slow rollout that country has more vaccine shots than we do i'm still on the like oh my god science got us a vaccine this is amazing so it is the one thing i think that kind of has changed and it is the game changer in what will allow us to do more outside of our own homes and outside of your own little bubble but it won't be this magic, everything goes, you get the shot one day, the next day you go back to normal. It has to be um, all of the people around you and then all of the people around all of us, the whole world, before we're kind of in this idea of what we want to be normal. You're still going to have to wear a mask. You're still going to have to do all of that. So in my pessimism, I'm already freaking out about the fights we're going to have when more of us have vaccine. That's a great point. How would you care? Like there, there are so many angles to take on this. And I want to talk to you about the dynamic between provincial governments and the federal government. Uh, Jason Kenney has been prominently critical as has health minister, Tyler Shandro, uh, premier Doug Ford with his, with his firecracker up the yin yang comments. I mean, just obviously political theater for sure. Uh, but placing pressure on the federal government, but with regards to the federal government in its negotiations with the pharmaceutical companies, um, Canada's lagging behind on, on some of the rates of, of inoculation and people will say, well, there's a lot that goes into this. How do you assess the job that the federal government's done? Again, I think this is one where my pessimism has paid off, where I find as um, Canada that it's shocking that we even have access to vaccine. We don't have manufacturers. We, we don't have a big biotech company in the country that uh, designs and develops these. The fact that we have any vaccine is still a surprise to me. It's not that I'm giving um, the Trudeau government uh, slack. It's that I have really low expectations for Canada on that front. So, but right now we are at the point where there's definitely frustration of, well, the federal government hasn't done X, Y, Z. Other countries have way more than us. And we have to keep in mind that this is a global shortage. Everybody wants one thing, one thing that did not exist um, like six months ago. So I still have a little bit more patience, but I understand the frustration coming from um, the provincial governments because it is the federal government's job to procure this. Some of the comparisons I find a little bit sketchy. Like, um, Ryan, if I can just jump into the one that really- Yeah, like, please do. Irks me. The one that really gets to me is where we look at and we say, look at Israel. They have done a fantastic job. They've paid way more money for the vaccine, which is fine if that's the choice that they've decided to make. But what the one thing that they have that we couldn't even offer if we wanted to was um, health data on their citizens. They gave a part of their negotiation package was to give Pfizer access to health data, digitized health data. We don't have digitized health data to begin with. If we wanted to trade that as a country, we don't have it. And I think we have to understand that this isn't a level playing field and that we are like invited to the tournament at all is amazing. But maybe I'm just like being way too hard on my country and I should have higher expectations. Well, no, I mean you, but you bring up a really interesting point to go back to something you said about a minute ago, Carrie. I mean, the, the fact that, that Canada is not developing a vaccine. Uh, well, let me, I want to be careful too what I say, because I know there's been a ton of research that's been going on at the U of A, et cetera. But, but do you think that this has been maybe a bit of a wake-up call um, 
to the nation or at least to elected leaders or maybe even to mm-hmm. industry folks that that we could be doing more on Canadian soil when it comes to the research and development here um, so that procurement wouldn't be such a big issue? Well, let's hope so, right? And especially because it's a high-tech industry. Those are the things that we want in Canada is high-tech intellectual economy. Um Maybe people see it as like, okay, we jump on it and for the next five or 10 years, we invest in it and then we kind of forget about it. And, but we can say that about so much of this. We can say that about uh, PPE, gowns, um, plastic eyeglasses, all of that. We can say, well, we should have these domestic industries. I think we can look at something like vaccines and look at it as a little bit more like there's reason um, from when you look at it, like, as you said, like U of A is uh, has industry there that there's a high tech component that we might want to pursue. And obviously it's valuable right now, but we also have to remember there'll be long stretches where it's not long stretches where we'll be pouring a lot of money into something that may never come to fruition. But, so, but even though we may not spit out a vaccine would still be valuable research. So where does this story go? I mean, I mean, you're keeping a keen eye. There's so many moving parts here. Where does the story go over the next week or two? In other words, what becomes the biggest issue in, in the general, you know, under the umbrella of vaccines? The one that I most worry about is trade protectionism right now, mm. where we're seeing in Europe calls to block exports. Um, and perhaps we'll see uh feistiness out of the United States. I'm not quite sure how that will affect affects our contracts in the United States. I think Europe right now is more of our concern. And so that is actually where I think the federal government has more control over sort of than the situation right now than the global shortage is um, using the diplomacy when uh, European countries want to lock down. And you can see why they would want to. We were just talking about the flip side of that two seconds ago, about why this is why we should have a domestic manufacturing. If we had domestic manufacturing, it doesn't necessarily mean that we would like hoard it all to ourselves. I mean, that's the argument that they're making right now in some producing countries. So right now, my eye is on the uh, nationalism around it. And that's where I think we... Um, can judge our federal government on its negotiating skills. I'm, I'm a little bit softer on the government when it comes to the global shortage and the contracts and the way all of that for now. I, I might change my mind later, but the protectionism is what worries me the most. Well, and like, I think we all have to be, you said you might change your mind later. It's th- th- This is a story with so many moving parts that we're just trying to get a sense of what's real and, 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 and where the ball is going, so to speak, and following it all. And I'm grateful for your excellent reporting uh, in the Globe and Mail and for your availability today, Carrie. Thank you for this. Anytime. Thanks for having me. You bet. Carrie Tate uh, does a great job out of Calgary for the Globe and Mail, uh, a journalist there in Canada's most read newspaper. You can follow her on Twitter at Carrie Tate. Uh, now is a good time to remind you that uh, our Real Talk builders are the ones that allow us to keep the pedal to the metal on stories like this coming to you live every single morning. And that includes the team at Local Waste. You know, you, you might sort of find yourself pigeonholing a company and what they do based on their description. But Local Waste, they've got a whole bunch of different angles on how they can help you with your waste management dilemma. They've been helping people find custom solutions. That's part of being a local owned and operated business locally owned for more than a quarter century is local waste and whether it's a small mom pop type setup that you've got or, or a big supermarket they want to work with you to earn your business so much so that they're putting their phone number out there chris and lauren want to talk trash with you to 780-242-9746 you know more emails uh and even a couple tweets over the weekend with photos of you those of you that joined up at cleanairclub.ca you said one guy just said He used the tagline. He says, I just want to save money, breathe easy. And he just sent me a photo of his clean air club furnace filters that showed up at his door. It's one of those things that falls by the wayside, isn't it? We know that. We forget to replace our furnace filter. And then by the time we pull it out and we realize that all the air that's been going through our vents has been running through that filter. And we go, oh, my gosh. Cleanairclub.ca is how you get that side of everything sorted out where you can save money and breathe easier. It's a beautiful thing. And finally, friends, 
We're getting to almost, it's February 1st, we're almost one month away from the grand opening of Friesen Brothers, their Rabbit Hill location in Alberta's capital city of Edmonton. It'll be their 15th Alberta location. Uh, Friesen Brothers getting set to open a store that is going to transform the grocery game. They've been supporting local producers, Alberta farmers, uh, Alberta beef, pork, turkey, chicken, even Alberta milled flour and their famous sourdough bread. Pretty soon, I'm just going to say, when this store opens in Edmonton, I'm going to say, I'm not saying anything else. Just go check it out for yourself. But in the meantime, Friesen Brothers, a reminder, Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Is Andre ready to rock and roll here? Okay, Andre Domis is going to join us a little later on in the show. This is a perfect time to take a look at our Why Station question of the week and remind you that each and every week, we go to you, our Real Talk panel. And we ask you to answer a question that'll that'll allow us to glean some insight into how the audience feels about issues that matter most. So first, we want to take a look back at last week's question of the week. We asked you about energy. In particular, we wanted to know where you were at with Keystone XL being canceled by President Joe Biden, who pulled the presidential permit and open pit coal mining in the Rockies. And we had a whole bunch of you, way over a thousand of you respond to this. As a matter of fact, more than 1,200, 1,225 uh, surveys completed. Sam, let's take a look at sort of the big picture stuff. This courtesy of the team at Y Station, who is our official research and strategy partner here at Real Talk. Uh, listeners, we're evenly split on support of the Keystone XL pipeline. But here's an interesting development. The next one, what happens? What happens when we, we throw a little uh, a glitch into the matrix and we ask you, okay, well, what if Keystone XL ran through the foothills or the Rocky Mountains? 26% of people who supported the pipeline said they would reconsider their support of the pipeline. In other words, sensitivities abound over exactly where it is. One of the third key points that the team at Y Station pulled from the data, and this is an interesting one as well, we'll put it up on the screen for you to see, is the takeaway. How do you feel about the push to lease coal mining sites in Alberta? 91% of listeners said, I feel dirty. Nine in 10 feel dirty. Now, the key findings of this report were interesting. Generally speaking, those of you that tune into this show, well, you don't believe that Keystone XL is salvageable. Uh, overwhelmingly, you told us that you believe that that pipeline is dead. You believe more than 70, rather nearly 70, but just under 70% of you, almost 7 in 10 of you, believe that energy still has a strong future in Canada's economy. Energy, that is, not just oil and gas. An even number of listeners support and oppose the pipeline. This is really interesting. 38% support Keystone XL. 38%, if you can believe it, do not support the idea of the Keystone Pipeline. But as mentioned, of that 38% that support it, 26% of, of those who support would turn their back on the project if you ran it through the mountains. Some of the comments that you left, and these are always interesting for us where we open it up and, and we say, tell us more. Tell us more about how you feel about this. One listener said, you know, we absolutely should play to our strengths, including utilizing our natural resources. But we also have an obligation as global citizens to be actively innovating and advancing how we use those resources and the types of resources we rely on. Alberta is rich in many other resources, not just hydrocarbons. Another viewer said, what about diversifying to new ideas, technology, information, research? What about catching up to the rest of the world? Another one of you said, in 50 years, our energy industry could look amazing if we can wrap our heads around getting into more sustainable energy sources, invest in research and development, and trust science. There's a major theme here that we took from this, and we're grateful that, that the team at Y Station was crunching numbers over the weekend, specifically Sunday night. You know, we close our questions at 3.30 on Sunday afternoon, and that's when they get to work at Y Station. The major theme, the major takeaway from this is that the fossil fuel party is coming to a close. Get on board or get left behind, said more than one of you. But there's big hope. There's optimism among real talkers, as if I needed to tell you that. You know that. There seems to be some inherent optimism in this group. You believe that Alberta and Canada can and will lead the world in renewable energy, which is really exciting. 
If Andre's ready to go, we'll go to the interview now. He's not with us yet. So here's here's what I want to do, Sam. Um, we've got this great uh, ability for you to just take my screen full screen. And I wanted to tee up this week's question of the week by actually answering it live on the show. Because I want you to see we're doing something a little bit different here. As you know, uh, the Prime Minister is tasked with naming, appointing a new Governor General. And so our question of the week this week touches on that, but it's fun. It's like a, it's a bracket style question. So we want you to come up with who you think should be the next governor general. We've come up with an initial list of 32 names, the CBC division, relatively serious Canadian contributors to public life, the ETOC division, you know, some of our most globally well-known Canadians, Uh, Those that could be in the running for the new governor general of Canada. So as you can see here, uh, Wednesday, February 3rd, we're going to need you to check back in. Okay, so this is the first time on the Real Talk Get Real question of the week that we need you to check in more than once. So we're going to get started here. Okay, so I want to make sure I've never gone through this live on the show before, but I want to do this. Okay, so first of all, you give us a little bit of information where you live. Okay, and then here we're going to go. So we're going to get into it. Okay, round one, Alex Janvier or Rupi Car. I'm going to go with Alex Janvier. Love his art. Okay, Beverly McLaughlin, Peter Mansbridge. you got to pick between the two. How do you not go with the former Chief Justice on that? Okay, uh, am I influencing the survey here? I hope I'm not influencing the survey. I, Joe I Clark. I think you influence it if you, if you finish it. Mm-hmm. But, well, yeah. we're, but what I'm going to have to come back on Wednesday anyway. So true. Uh, Joe Clark and McClellan, I'm going to go with Landslide Annie. Uh, Fred Penner, or, oh, the former University of Alberta president, Indira Semisakura. I'm, I'm going to, ooh, uh, 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 okay. Sorry, Fred. Anne Murray or Chris ooh. Hadfield? I'm going with the former astronaut, former commander of the International Space Station. Murray Sinclair, in my opinion, might actually be the top choice of this entire exercise. I'm going Murray. Haley Wickenheiser, Margaret Atwood. Ooh, that's a tough choice. I'd be curious to know how most, this is a, I'm going to go Atwood. I'd go Atwood. I'm going and Atwood. I, I would go Atwood purely based on age. Haley Wickenheiser is in med school right now. Margaret Atwood is. Uh, Haley yeah, could use a could use a good new has, could use a new job. Isn't it funny that we say to somebody that Haley Wickenheiser, one of one of Canada's most decorated athletes in history? I'm thinking <laughs> she's got a bright future ahead of her. Yeah, and then she retires and goes to med school. <laughs> we're we're going to give the the real talk alumni advantage goes to Arlene Dickinson on this one. Although Clara Hughes has, has done an amazing job for mental health awareness, obviously as an Olympian as well. Oh, now I got to narrow this down here. Oh, Alex Janvier is going to beat Indira here in my mind. Murray Sinclair, as mentioned, beating the former commander of the International Space Station. This is tough. <sighs> former Deputy PM, former Chief Justice. I'm going Justice McLaughlin. I'm going, oh, Atwood over Dickinson. Dickinson over Atwood. Arlene Dickinson's got too much. She's got more to do on the business front. I'm going to go Margaret Atwood, so I'm narrowing it down. Okay, so you see how this goes. Okay, so this gives you an idea, and I'm going to con- continue to complete this. Um, we're going to, we're going to c- kind of work on this. Oh, do we go Carly Ray Jepsen or Elliot page? I'm going to go Elliot page. Should I just keep running through this? Sam, I, I like want- I'm thinking about my picks now. Uh, now this, now this is more what we have to remind ourselves. We're talking governor general here. We're not just talking hunks because Ryan Reynolds versus Ryan Gosling is an existential question. It's the battle of the Canadian Ryan, the battle of the, of well, there's three, oh, um, okay, but these yeah. are, but these <laughs> But these are, two, but these are two of them. Uh, I'm going to go Reynolds uh, with apologies to Gosling. Oh, Lauren Cardinal is going to get my vote here over Jan Arden. No offense, D- Dan Levy. I love Lauren Cardinal. Has Dan has Dan Levy done enough winning this year, sweeping the Emmys with think, his yeah, dad? I don't think he'd be interested in it. No, I don't think he'd do it either. Randy Bachman or Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I'm going to go the guy that would take care of business. Sandra Oh gets it over Celine Dion in my mind. Oh, Nav Batcha, Raptors super fan over Drake. No oh, question there. Keanu yeah. Reeves over Alanis Morissette. Nav is like the immigrant success story. The guy's you know incredible. what I mean? Yeah, he's, he's amazing. incredible. I'm going to go, uh, 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 this is a tough one, Keanu Reeves, because they're not going to win. It doesn't matter. This. I wonder how many people are doing this alongside with us. This is a lot of fun. I'm going Elliot Page over Sandra Oh. I'm going to go Lauren Cardinal over Nav Batcha. This is just gut instinct stuff. This is just knee jerk. I'm just picking it quickly. Dan Levy, Randy Backman. No offense, Randy. Randy will... Have plenty of gigs to keep them happy. Okay, so I'm not going to leave any comments here for purposes of time. Okay, now here's where it gets into who are you, and I won't fill this out here. So th- that gives you a good sense of you're able to provide us with with some data that, that allows us to understand who's watching, 
who's listening. And of course, it allows us to understand more about what you care about. That's really why our Why Station questions of the week are so important. It's your way to communicate with the show. I mean, there are other ways too on the chat using the hashtag RealTalkRJ. But you allow us to understand what are the issues that matter? Where do you land on them? Where are you watching or listening from? How old are you? What's your occupation? What's your level of education? And then we continue to really sort of tweak our editorial process to ensure that this show is delivering what you would expect it to deliver. So thanks to everybody in advance that's going to take part in this week's Y Station Question of the Week. Uh, the team at Y Station put a ton of work into building those brackets, and we're really looking forward to a strong response. So again, you got to get in today or tomorrow and then return on Wednesday to see how it all plays out. And of course, next Monday, we will reveal who real talkers have chosen as Canada's next governor general. We will humbly submit that list to the prime minister's office and we'll see what happens from there. Uh, Park Power has been in the natural gas, electricity and internet game since 2013. And from the beginning, from the very beginning, they made a commitment to profit share. So 10% of their profits, which is not a small thing, they plug back into the community with their charities of choice. And I encourage you to follow them on all their social media platforms where they highlight those nonprofits. Real community connection is what you get when you sign up at parkpower.ca. And a reminder, whether you're residential or commercial, if you use the hashtag or rather the promo code 2021-RealTalk, you're going to get 70 bucks off your first bill. 2021-RealTalk at parkpower.ca. This is also a reminder that it doesn't matter how cold it is outside. doesn't matter whether there's a, a winter storm warning or frozen highways. The team at Eden Landscaping is already looking ahead to this spring and summer. And they want to inspire you to do the exact same thing as you envision your outdoor space, its potential, and what realizing that potential might look like. So whether it's upgrading your flower boxes, your planters, or whether it's a total overhaul, new build, or maybe even a home that's been in the family for generations, Eden Landscaping for more than 20 years has been pulling out all the stops to make your dream come true. You can find them at landscapeedmonton.ca or under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. How's Andre doing? Ready to rock? Looks like he's ready to go. Okay. I'm, uh, this uh, conversation, uh, this is one where, where I have no idea where it's going to go because I barely understand the story. You've been paying attention to Wall Street over the past week or so. I mean, how could you not? Uh, GameStop in particular, but people are talking about Wall Street bets. People are talking about what this could mean for the future of finance. Now, on Friday's show, we took you through uh, a, tick, a, a, a series of TikTok videos that I think made, made pretty good sense of what was going on in layperson's terms. The guy on that video is a contributing editor to McLean's. Uh, he's a partner uh, when it comes to the Black Indie Media Network in Canada and a friend of this show, Andre Domis. Welcome to Real Talk and thanks for making time for us on this Monday. No worries, no worries. Your your TikTok videos, uh, I, I mean, it, it was incredible because you took something that, that most people, I think, can barely understand, and that's kind of been part of the premise, I think, of how uh, financial managers and investment houses and Wall Street operates is, is trying to maintain a level uh, uh, where most common folk like us can't understand what's going on, but you made it, <laughs> you made it understandable. What prompted you to put those videos out? Was it was it the the myriad of people just wondering out what the hell is going on? Uh, well, what, what was happening was that uh, people were uh, tweeting that they had no idea what was going on. Like they they couldn't really understand uh, like the language that was being used or why it is that if a company's stock value was going up, that somebody else would be losing money or that a hedge fund could possibly be in trouble. So I was like, okay, do you do you want me to explain it in a TikTok or something? And that was just a joke. Like I was I was totally kidding. And people were like, yes, absolutely, please do this. Just just do it. Like we can't understand. So I was like, all right, I will do my absolute best. And uh, when I I I thought I was going to be able to do it, maybe like two or three, and then I realized trying to explain it at the very beginning, I was like, I'm not going to be able to do this in like a couple of TikTok. It's going to take maybe like six or seven. I uh, and I thought no one's gonna no one's gonna listen to seven whole TikToks like that's ridiculous, uh, but I recorded them. I put them out at like six in the morning, 
And then I went to sleep because I'm a total insomniac. I, I didn't actually sleep until like 6.30, 7 o'clock that morning. Uh, when I woke up later, uh, apparently it had gone like super viral. And uh, people were saying that it was the first time that they'd ever seen it explained in a way that they could understand it. So I guess it worked. Um, having worked in the financial industry for, you know, going on like 12 years um, before leaving to, uh, to do journalism, I, it was easy enough for me to understand. But the thing that I really don't like about business journalism is that it's, it, it, it's like a, uh, there's, a, there's a language, there's a sort of like a parlance in the industry that's almost like mysticism. And you can explain things in very easy to understand language working in business journalism, but a lot of the times they just choose not to. Uh, so that's what I was trying to cut past. Andre, this, this story is, um, you know, you could pick it up from a thousand different angles. Um, we, could, we could talk about where this all started on Reddit, we could talk about the power of the internet. We could talk about the power of the people. We could talk about what this means for, for future stocks. I mean, what, what could this mean for, I mean, I've seen people talking about Blockbuster, AMC theaters, or like all, all different kinds of, you know, what does this mean for the future of Wall Street? As we have, have, have seen the weekend tick on by and, and, and now stock markets are open again, when we get up to speed on this Monday, what are you keeping an eye on now? Or what, what's your angle of approach on this story right now? Right now, I'm looking like uh, I, I'm I'm not really following the story for any like future developments on stocks or to see like what's going to be like the next, uh, you know, the, the next hot tip. I'm just waiting for the whole thing to blow up. <laughs> Frankly, I'm just I'm just here for the ride. I just, I'm, it's, it's just funny to me. The whole thing is very funny because I've never seen uh, at any, any time in the past, like at least not in my lifetime that I know of, I've seen, I've seen things like uh, the, the, the dot-com bubble. I was in my teens when the dot-com bubble happened and, and then that collapsed. I was in my twenties uh, when the 2008 financial crisis happened, but I, I've never seen anything like this where people deliberately buy and hang on to a stock knowing they're probably just lighting their money on fire and doing it for the purpose of burning a hedge fund. I've never seen anything like that. And I don't know that you can really create uh, a financial model that takes that into account that somebody will like light their own position on fire just to make sure that your own coattails catch. So to me, this is just uh, a, a bit of a joke. It's just a prank. I've never seen Wall Street get trolled like this before. Yeah, no kidding. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, on the ticker right now. Um, GameStop Corp trading at approximately, I mean, people are going to listen to this podcast a week from now, and this is going to be totally irrelevant, but it's at about 248 bucks right now, which would be down about 70, 78 bucks. I'm watching it flux live as we talk from the start of trading. Yeah. It's, it's down approximately 24% today at some point. Uh, this whole thing's going to fall apart and, and somebody's going to be left holding the bag and, and some folks are going to lose a lot of money. Some people have made money hand over fist on this, not the people you might suspect. And then there's a bunch of talk about bailouts, you know, Robin Hood stopping trading and hedge funds uh, uh. getting big multi-billion dollar loans. That's an interesting angle to key in on. Well, here's the, the funny thing about that. And I tried to explain this one as well. When Robinhood was stopping trading last week on, it wasn't just GameStop, it was also AMC, Nokia, and a couple of others. I thought that was really interesting because they were restricting the purchasing, but they didn't restrict the sale of those stocks. Now, if you're a, a hedge fund company who is short on your position, and I'm trying to use like the most non-technical language possible. Thank you. But <laughs> no problem. <laughs> If you're in a if you're in a short position, what that if you're in a short position and you're being squeezed, what that means is you've promised to sell somebody else a stock at a certain price, at a certain agreed upon price. But the thing is, if you don't own that stock in the first place, uh, you're in a naked position. And this is just one of those weird Wall Street things to me that never really made sense, and I'm not sure how it's legal, but. If you're in a naked position, what that means is you've sold somebody the option to purchase the stock. They, they have the ability to exercise the option to purchase the stock, but you don't actually even own it in the first place. Meaning that if you get called on it, then you have to find the stock somewhere in order to give it the person, the stock that you promised that you were going to sell them for this agreed upon price. So if you are just a regular investor and you are not allowed to purchase the stock, what that indicates to me is that it's almost like Robin Hood is co like covering the tails of people who are scrambling to find the stock 
to sell it to cover their position, but the regular investor uh, is not allowed to buy it. All they can do is sell. So who's on the other side of the equation here? If you can only sell, who's buying the stock? Well, the answer is, is those hedge fund companies who are trying to cover their tails that are allowed to buy the stock uh, and you, the regular investor, are not allowed to buy it. So it's almost like they're they're helping out their buddies uh, that are that are scrambling to find the stock to be able to buy it to cover their positions. That's what it seems like to me. I'm not going to say that's exactly what Robinhood is doing because I don't want to get sued, but you get the idea. Yeah, well, you, you can talk about your opinion on something. In your opinion, <laughs> what do you think the long... I mean, I'm asking you way too early, uh, so it's an unfair question. But, but what do you think the residual or lasting impact will be when it comes to the perception of the stock market, when it comes to the perception of, of Wall Street? This is far from the first time that we've seen a major disruption on Wall Street. But, but what do you think? The, is this a game changer with regards to public opinion? I don't know. I, I think uh, I hope what it does is help demystify this idea that there is an invisible hand guiding the market. And that the market will provide like we a lot of times I find both in business journalism and in the industry altogether. They talk about this, quote unquote, like this market as if it's this uh, this capricious God that you have to, uh, you know, provide the proper conditions to keep it pleased and to keep the line going up. And hopefully this has demystified a lot of that and, you know, uh, helped uh, tear down the uh, the walls and overturn the money changers table in this strange religion. And people understand that there is such a thing as shareholder activism, like that can be done. But also you don't have to listen to these people. Like you don't have to listen to these, like this business journalist that tells you, that tell you that, uh, you know, if the market goes up then the rich benefit, but if the market goes down, then you, a regular working class person should also have to suffer. Uh, I think it, it I, I hope that it shows uh, that these hedge fund parasites uh, should be made to suffer. I hope it shows uh, that this is entirely a game. None of this has anything to do with GameStop or AMC or Nokia whatsoever, all of this is just simple rampant speculation. And uh, those who speculate on you know, the, uh, the price of a company and try to make money off of their, uh, their, their death should be made to suffer. So I, uh, to me, this is uh, a bit of a, a joke. It's, it's a bit of a troll. And uh, I hope that this uh, really pulls the wool off of people's eyes that all this is just a game. The one thing that I, you know, a friend texted me this over the weekend and I haven't done too much digging into it, but it kind of, he's a guy, he's a public servant, he pays into a pension. And he said one of the stories that he thinks that isn't getting enough play on this is that hedge funds are managing pensions. And he said, so, you know, people are talking about, you know, the parasites here and, and, and sort of, you know, the, the whole, like, here's your own medicine angle on this. But he said, in his words, he said, people like me that don't even understand the story could end up being the ones getting screwed. Do you think that there's a risk there? I mean, yes. Hedge funds don't necessarily manage pensions. Pensions invest in hedge funds, so right. they, you know, they 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 take part of their uh, uh, assets and uh, give it to a hedge fund and say, "Here, we, we, can you can you uh, help us find some growth?" Here's the problem with that: this idea of perpetual growth in the markets, and this does affect pension funds. It affects uh, you know institutional funds, etc. The problem is, you know, the kinds of growth that you would normally see in pension funds throughout the, you know, the 70s, the 80s, you know, in the Reagan years, uh, the kind of double digit growth that you would see on an annual basis or on a long term basis is just not sustainable anymore. Uh, Sometime around the 1980s, especially during like the Reagan Thatcherite years, the market turned from being able to find growth based on productivity to finding growth based on mining through speculation and financialization. So the kind of growth that we're seeing produced in the market now is partially productivity and partially out of simple, like speculating, uh, like you're at a casino. So it's like these pension funds have given money to a bag man. The bag man goes off to a casino, you know, plays a few rounds of craps and then comes back and and hands over a portion of the winnings uh, to, to the pension funds. And this is unfortunate, uh, you know, if this uh, if 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 these hedge funds are left holding the bag and they end up getting torched, will it affect pension funds? Yes, absolutely. It will. But I think this is also uh, a bit of a wake up call in that the kind of growth that we have just come to expect on a normal basis is not sustainable long term. And unfortunately, you know, it, it will affect the hedge funds. But I, I think it's also an object lesson that hedge funds should not be a source of growth for pension funds in the first place, in these speculative, these risky investments 
um, that I don't even think really ought to be even legal uh, shouldn't form a part of the uh, the hedge fund investment strategy. So if they end up getting torched as a result, I- I'm sorry, but that's the game that they were playing. Yeah, I, w- I was listening to a fascinating interview over the weekend on the uh, Bill Simmons podcast talking about you know some some people sort of have an inherent aversion um, to 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 the idea of betting against companies. Um, and, and I guess on the flip side of that, you could say, you know, without that, without shorting and, and things like that, um, you know, you, you may never, the world may never have caught on to Enron when it did as an example. Um, so uh, you can probably sort of argue it from either side. Do you have a, do you have an opinion on this is, well, it's not, it's not the short, it's not the shorting that, uh, that I personally have a problem with. It's not the shorting per se. It's the naked calls. So shorting is is I mean the 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 speculation on a stock going down is one thing, but being able to sell a naked short that is selling somebody the option to purchase the stock when you don't even own the stock in the first place that you're borrowing it from somebody else so the same stock can have literally like two or three different calls on it at the same time that to me is the kind of like the the kind of risky speculation that shouldn't be allowed and normally you know institutional funds are not allowed to do uh naked calls but hedge funds because they fall into a different class of investment and because quote unquote accredited investors um are the ones that are allowed to invest in hedge funds not your average uh not your not your average investor um they fall under a bit a different category of rules so they can get away with things that normal funds can't and the stuff that they can get away with, frankly, ought to be regulated, in my opinion. Uh, got interesting questions here on our live chat. Uh, talking to Andre Domis, Dan uh, wonders if you think that the SEC fraudulently stopped trade. I've seen some people say that that Robinhood may be able to win back public favor. I mean, the irony of their name here, but but may be able to win back <laughs> public favor by by kind of putting this on the shoulders of the SEC and saying, "Hey, we were in, we were instructed to do whatever we could to stop the madness." Um, do you have an opinion on how the SEC factors into any of this? I, I mean, the the SEC uh, is it has a bit of a tautological existence. The SEC exists to stop the SEC from looking silly, and unfortunately, this caused the SEC to look silly. Like it caused the whole game to look silly in the first place. So I think that uh, there's a possibility that public opinion can be won back. Uh, but Robinhood, I think, uh, acted in the interest of one of their clients. And unfortunately, when people see the uh, Robinhood acting in the interest of a large institutional clients rather than the average investor, it does make it very difficult to win that back. I know your your alarm's going, or somebody needs to get in touch oh. with you. We only ask for oh, you. Oh yeah, sorry. To, no, it's all good, man. We we, we ask for you till ten, uh, well, till twelve thirty Eastern. It's twelve thirty Eastern, so we gotta let you go. But uh, Andre, as we were talking, I was scrolling through your Twitter to me. I said, well, in case he's posted anything groundbreaking or important since we went live on the air, <laughs> I want to make sure. And I want to ask you about this. I hope you don't mind. It's February first. It's Black History Month, and and you tweeted, uh, I'm celebrating Black History Month by turning down all media requests to do Black History <laughs> Month panels and writing. How come? I uh, I find that uh, when Black History Month comes around, you'll you'll, and this is not just me. It's you know, it's a lot of other Black journalists. At the same people that you haven't heard from in a, in a whole 12 months mm. uh, want to call you up and say, Hey, would you like to come and do this panel, or would you like to uh, write an article for us on what Black History Month means to you, and so on and so on. And it's just like, if I haven't heard from you in a year, then I'm not I'm not going to talk to you now. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to do my own thing, but I write on a lot of other subjects beyond simply like you know race and, and Black history. And so forth. But if that's all you're interested in hearing from me, the answer is no. Thank you. I think it's a fair position to take. Can I ask you in closing, um, in particular, is there something that you focus on every February of every year or, or do you have something in particular you're focusing on or celebrating or recognizing or learning more about as part of Black History Month 2021? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. I, uh, I'm also a grad student at York University, and I've been studying um, slave history and slave rebellions for quite a bit. Um, I don't have anything planned publicly because I'm really just trying to get through my program. Uh, but what I am uh, working on, at least for the uh, the next couple of years, is uh, how the, uh, the the history of rebellions in uh, Caribbean countries actually contributed to the existence of countries like the United States of America, like how it is that uh, that slave rebellions actually ended up shaping the world as we know it today.
Well, I look forward to reading what you find. As always, you have such a way with words. Uh, Andre Domisa, contributing editor of McLean's, a partner with the uh, Resistance NWA uh, Black Indie Media Network. Thank you so much for, for helping us try to make sense of what could be such a convoluted story involving Wall Street. Andre, we really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And I hope I explain things in terms that people can actually understand. I'm, like I said, tried to use non-technical language. I hope no, I you, you nailed it, my man, and we appreciate it. Thank you. I take it easy. Yeah, and, this, and these these are one of those stories uh, for sure uh, where you know some people will say you know he's he's missing this angle or you know or they're not talking about that and and that's kind of the whole point is that there are so many angles on this you know we're going to be talking um, about the different implications here with regards to public trust in the markets with regards to stability with regards to how this changes trading uh, people managing their own uh, investments be careful with that obviously. Um, I'm case in point. I had some. I had. A, I had a slush fund account that I was playing around with. Part of that. Part of that green rush. Who else thought that they were going to get rich on cannabis stocks three years ago in Canada? And how did that work out for you? Um, <laughs> you probably saw a huge rise in value here, and then now you're probably seeing a lot of those come back down to earth as well, right? All this talk about prudence and you know diversification and, and everything else. We have a lot to learn for those of us that aren't professional fund managers, but also really. I think a big impact that this has had is is what exactly do professional fund managers do? Now, I'm not taking anything away from the science, the craft, but I think that the curtain's been pulled back a little bit on how stock prices can be manipulated. I think that the curtain's been pulled back a little bit on how some of this works, right? And I think some people are educating themselves now, uh, maybe more than ever before, on, on some of these issues that, quite frankly, uh, impact billions or even trillions of dollars on the markets. So it's fascinating stuff. The team at Alta Moving and Storage right now is ready to help you sort out your solution when it comes to the big move that you have in store. So whether it's upsizing or downsizing, they've got these pod style containers that make the process so much easier. You know, you talk to anybody that does research into what stresses us as human beings, you know, questions around the health of our families, public speaking, moving. These are all right at the top of the list and they want to take that stress and alleviate it. They've been alleviating people's stress around moving for years. They want to do the same for you locally owned and operated. You can find them online. Just check out the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. That's also where you'll find the team at Kubi Energy. And of course, it's Monday, so you know where this is going. Kubi Energy and its team is certified by Tesla. And they're also, every single person that's going to be up on your roof or on your property, whether it's a commercial or residence, uh, they're, they're, well, they're not sort of like weekend warriors when it comes to electrical installation, right? They're journeyman electricians in BC and Alberta, which means that Kubi is proud to employ Western Canadian uh, journeyman electricians. It also means you can have the confidence that the installation is done right, and it's one that you can trust. Now, the team at Kubi every single Monday also brings us a little something we call Positive Reflections. Sam and I have been waiting to roll on this video ever since Two Beaver sent it to us, I think, a week ago, Sam, or at least six days ago. Let's meet Got JoJo. In very early. Yeah. All right, let's meet JoJo. This is JoJo. And JoJo is participating in, in one of the oldest methods of passing time in canine history. <laughs> two, Beaver <laughs> said, boy. two Beaver says he's my very boy, first dog. Know? I said, tell us a little Get bit it. about JoJo. Get it, my boy. Get it. Two Beaver says he loves to be That's vacuumed. Thing, eh? <laughs> That's right. JoJo loves to be vacuumed. My dog wants you? to fight the vacuum. <laughs> As you can tell, <laughs> JoJo loves to chase his tail, oh too. Says, oh, you know what? what Two Beaver it says it's it's it's, it's been a tough crazy. year. <laughs> says, I've been targeted by groups. My cabin's been broken into. My vehicle's been vandalized, but I'll tell you what, the joy and laughter that I get from my pets, including JoJo, has been amazing. Two Beaver goes on to say, love the show. Well, we love that you're part of it, Two Beaver, and thanks for that. Well, let's get to our next submission. I love this one. This from a teacher. 
This is absolutely beautiful. Said, I love drawing with chalk. This is KCN, a proud real talker, a teacher. Check this out. As kids returned for the semester, quoting that remarkable address given at the inauguration of President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris. Absolutely beautiful. For there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. How like that. Okay, let's get to our next one. Another positive reflection. These are all submitted by you to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We love this one. This one here, Leanne says, our three-year-old learned how to stop on his skates. I thought that's pretty impressive. Well, okay, that's how. So when learning to stop on skates at three, I thought, wow, ahead of the curve. Uh, oh, yeah, that's how I did it till I was about 12 as well. So congratulations to the little gaffer. Amazing. And this one posted by Brandy Moore. And you know, Brandy's been on the show before. Uh, does an amazing job reporting for different media outlets. This was submitted, though, uh, by a couple of different listeners. And this is absolutely beautiful. We love it. April was the one that brought it to my attention first. Lance Cardinal, a Cree artist, completing this beautiful 30-foot mur- mural titled Intergenerational Love at the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women in Edmonton. Look at this. Lance Cardinal's just killing it lately. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Huge shout out to the artists there and to those of you that have passed along your positive reflections. And I wanted to read this in closing. Uh, We recognize that a lot of you are listening to the podcast going, you know, we can't see this. Well, you can go to YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can watch it on its own. Positive reflections if you want to see these. But I got this message from Hassan. And Hassan wrote in and said, you know, there was, there was a, a sad post about this 11-year-old girl that had gone missing. Police were looking for her. Uh, a young hijabi girl and said, I was distraught. I knew that I, I had to do something here. It just it inspired me. I couldn't sleep knowing that there was essentially a child out in this freezing weather. I called my friends. They don't know her, by the way, this young girl who's since been found. It says, by, by 11, 15 p.m., we set out in pairs of two in cars. We canvassed the area trying to locate her family's information by community calling, using every resource we could. We searched parks and fields and business areas, and we talked to the crews at gas stations. We went to the transit center. We were asking bus drivers if they had seen a girl wearing a hijab, a gray jacket, a backpack. A bus driver named Samson said he had dropped somebody off with that description 30 minutes ago, and he told us where. Now, keep in mind, these are citizens. These aren't police officers. Well... Imagine our surprise, says Hassan, when we found her at a bus stop freezing. She said she was lost. She couldn't get home. We took her home. She's safe with her family. They're worried about frostbite. Her family certainly took her immediately to the hospital for medical care. We will be meeting with her to follow up, inshallah, in the coming days. Hassan says this was a lesson for me and everybody involved. We need to remember to be united, to come together, to do our part always, whenever we can. Because you never know what you can accomplish. Hassan says our thanks to my friends, Shukri, Liban, Mohammed, Fozia, Faduma, and Samson, the bus driver, and the biggest thanks to God. That from Hassan. You can be in touch with us anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Tomorrow morning's show, you won't want to miss it. It's already coming together and looking like a good one, including Senator Doug Black and a roundtable conversation on body image. And just a reminder, we'll start it late. It's a 9 a.m. Mountain, 11 a.m. Eastern start tomorrow because I'm walking my little guy to kindergarten for his first day. Family first, friends. Make it a great Monday, and we'll talk to you soon.